And here we go. Talk about how skeptics react and respond to that evidence, specifically how they dodge that evidence. So dodge that evidence. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good start. I, I don't know what to say there. It's like, I want to say something, but I want to be very careful how I put it. I guess, I guess I'll appeal to a sense of empathy. Like, um, I have, uh, some scholars video here, uh, and he's talking about evidence and you Christians, you're just dodging what this scholar has to say. Um, that's the reverse of what he's saying. Um, but I, it's not helpful, I don't think. So I'm Mike Winger and welcome to the Tuesday live stream. This is a weekly live stream every Tuesday. Almost. Oh, there we go. Almost every Tuesday. <laughs> Almost every Tuesday. In fact, next week we won't be doing it. But um, where we deal with issues of theology and apologetics. And we tackle those issues and we try to think our way through them. And we sort of plod through them. And basically we're building up the Christian worldview. We're, we're asking ourselves to love God with all of our minds. And so um, here's the setup, as I explain, because I always like to start my videos by just telling you exactly what we're going to do before uh, we do it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you the, a very brief summarized version of the case or the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Some of the evidence, not all of it. Then to how skeptics respond to that evidence, how skeptics react to that evidence, because it's, it's in hearing their responses that you're muted, Cam. So I think it is worth repeating Mike's point there. Mike isn't claiming to give a comprehensive defense of his apologetic for the resurrection. And he's also not claiming to give a comprehensive um, uh, presentation or analysis of how skeptics respond. So I think that's worthwhile keeping in mind as we Watch the that you start to video. realize how good the evidence actually is. And I'm going to talk about specific skeptics. So we're going to deal with like Matt Dillahunty, David Hume, Sam Harris, um, uh, Dan Barker. Let's see, we'll do with Richard Carrier and um, Bart Ehrman as well. So a bunch of guys we'll talk about specific skeptics. All those guys that I just mentioned are, uh, are atheists or atheist leaning. And here's why I'm doing this. Um, every year, and I mean every year, we get junk uh, on TV and on uh, social media and in news newspapers and articles and all this that is based on horrible, pathetic, laughable scholarship that's meant to attack the resurrection of Christ. Every year there's like a new movie or something that comes out that's meant to just basically defame or attack, basically using the resurrection, creating controversy, trying to make some money. But the scholarship behind it is laughable. Remember the lost tomb of Jesus? Remember that? That was such a joke. Or just recently, um, the whole movie with uh, Joaquin Phoenix with um, Mary Magdalene, and I only saw the trailer, so forgive me if the trailer misrepresented the movie, but if it represented it accurately, the trailer for this film shows Mary as being the secret disciple of Jesus who has like more uh, importance than all the other disciples, and it kind of hints at some special relationship between the two of them and all that. And the hints behind it are that it's going back to like the Da Vinci Code which is one of the worst examples of fabrication in the name of history that the modern times have seen. Uh, I think I agree with uh, a lot of things he's saying here. Me too. I, I think that um, the Tomb of Jesus stuff was largely like based on poor statistic, statistical analysis. And um, the Da Vinci Code obviously is historical fiction. It's pretty much plain and simple. And yeah, there are, if it's made to attack the resurrection during Easter time, but at the same time, there's also a lot of public displays of, you know, faith in Christ too. And I know that I get um, plenty of increased uh, traffic surrounding Christ and his resurrection on my Facebook feed, for example, um, during this time. So it goes both ways. So every year, this kind of stuff just comes up and crops up and casually pokes at the resurrection. But 
Every year also, there are Christians who are going out there making the well-researched historical case, evidence-based case for the resurrection of Christ. Not based on Dan Brown's imagination, right? Not, not based on the lost tomb of Jesus stuff, but based upon actual historical documents that go back to the first century, based upon the things that historians agree on. And they're saying, based on on what historians agree on, we have good reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the evidence-based case. So we're going to get to this soon as Mike starts introducing some more of his case. But already there, he sets up a um, like a presumption. It, it's something that leads into what he later says. In particular, he says that historians agree on. So um, what does Mike mean by that? Does Mike mean that there are two historians who agree on it? Does he mean by that that 50% of historians agree on it? Or does he mean what I think a lot of people would take that statement to mean is that, say, 95% of historians agree on it? I heard, uh, and, I heard that um, Habermas had like a database of sort of like a survey of what historians believe and what they don't. Have you heard that? And has he ever published that? Yeah, so I have heard that. Um, he's talked about it um, both in his apologetical defenses on his website, um, but also in published articles, for example, in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. He published an article in, I think, 2005, where he talks about some of it. But no, he's never released the database or the catalog. And when asked about it, he has said, for example, that he is still collecting um, statistics based upon new writings that appear and therefore doesn't want to um, publish it until it's complete. But I mean, it's a little bit silly because it's never going to be complete. People are going to be continue to, continuing to discuss this. Um, but no, he hasn't released the methodology that he used to conduct the survey. Um, also, it's been very difficult to get details of exactly uh, what criteria he used for um, which type of people are included. For example, in the article mentioned that I just mentioned before, the 2005 article um, in the journal for, journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus, he actually includes scholars or makes mention of scholars like Richard Swinburne, who's a philosopher and not even a historian. So we at least know that in this database are included people who are not even qualified to give. Wait, wait um, um, philosophers are not automatically historians? <laughs> um, well, according to some people, if they comment on history, they become historians. But um, but yeah, no, okay, we should get they, they don't. They don't qualify. They don't count as qualified experts in the field. Okay, let's keep going. Not a uh, believe it because we say so because it's religiously important case. That's not what it is. So today we're gonna um, we're gonna look at that evidence based case. We're gonna look at how skeptics respond to it, and that is where I think the gold is. So hopefully you'll stick with me all the way to the end because if you've heard this case before, just know I'm only gonna give a summary of it. What you really want to get to is how they react because that's where I'm gonna spend most of my time today. So that's what we're doing. Let me uh, let me just get the little slideshow ready because I have it I, I have it up and I want to share with you guys because in this case you really need the visual. Uh, it helps it stick more in your head for sure. So all right, here's my little here's my little slideshow for you. Very high tech. Um, I'm going to give you five points that are historically accepted. These, these are not things I'm making up on the spot. They're not things that are, that are just totally conjecture. Um, historians generally agree. They generally agree. That's an important point I'm making about these five facts. Okay. And, and different guys like Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, um, other guys have made the same case and, um, in better than I will, but, but here's me putting it all in a, a cleverly packaged acronym to make it easier to remember. So the first piece of evidence is that historically speaking, based on uh, first century documentation, based upon evidence we have going back to the time, we believe that there really was a death by crucifixion. Jesus really did die. The second piece of evidence is that ladies found the tomb empty, uh, that it was uh, women disciples. Now, now pause right here, because already I'm losing some skeptics. 
I'm not saying we believe this. Please hear me. I'm not saying believe this because it's in the Bible. No, I'm saying here's what people who don't believe the Bible, who are historians, generally agree on when they talk about what happened in the first century. So ladies, women actually went to the tomb and found it empty. It has, this has to do with things like the criterion of embarrassment. And I won't, I won't get into all that because uh, that's not what this live stream is all about. Because guess what? I don't feel like I have to make a case for all these things. My whole point is that historians already have made the case. The whole point here is these are the agreed on facts. So um, I just want to make a point about the criterion on, uh, of embarrassment um, because I don't think it's a good criterion because uh, there's a gospel, infancy gospel, where uh, Jesus is playing with some other children. Now, I know this is not considered inspired and not part of the canon, but at some point, people have to decide what goes in the Bible and what doesn't. And so if we're looking at the infancy gospel of Jesus playing with other children, uh, something happened. I think one child bumped uh, Jesus and Jesus got mad and killed the kid when Jesus was a kid. <laughs> so, you know, here's a kid killing uh, another kid. And then the parents get upset and says, hey, um, Jesus killed my kid. Do something about it. And then Jesus brought the kid back to life. Now, that's an embarrassing story about Jesus. Um, now, according to the criterion of embarrassment, um, that should be more true than false uh, because it's very embarrassing. Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, there's more to say on the validity of, of that. I, I do acknowledge that Mike, while he made mention of it, didn't actually make a case for um, point number two. Um, he instead is, you know, simply deferring to um, what he considers expert consensus. Yeah. But yeah, as you point out, the criteria of embarrassment has some difficulties, um, especially in how it's, how it's applied in the Gospels. And a number of um, authors like Dale Allison and Stanley Porter um, Richard Carrier, a, a number of uh, authors who have written on this criteria do actually find issues with the way it's applied to Jesus content. Okay, let's uh, keep going. So we're trying to argue from agreed on facts to this question about the resurrection. So the second one is ladies find the tomb empty. The third is that there were independent appearances of Jesus alive after death. The, ma the vast majority of historians do believe this. They say, yeah, there were independent, like that's like not one person, but separate different accounts where people said, I saw Jesus alive after his death. They believed this. They actually saw something. Um, now the historians, many of them won't answer the question of what did they actually see? Was it Jesus physically alive or not? They'll just back off that and they'll go, we're just saying the evidence says they saw something that was quote, an appearance of Jesus, uh, apparently. And then number four, we have the violence endured by the apostles. This has to do with after the resurrection, right? Before the resurrection, they were cowering, they were hiding, they had forsaken, abandoned Christ, and then they had a flip and they were now preaching Jesus to the point of themselves being persecuted, tortured, and many of them even killed for this message that Jesus had, Jesus had risen from the dead. So that's another historical fact. They're just saying this actually happened. And then five, the enemies of Christ converted the enemies of Christ converted. So specifically the two that really come up the most in the debate about the resurrection is James and Paul. See James, the brother of Jesus, who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah while he was alive, but after his death saw him alive, according to an account that goes to within five years of the resurrection. Again, I'm just summarizing this. If you want to hear the whole case, um, you can see it on my, my YouTube channel, Evidence for the Resurrection, or you can uh, go to, even hear a better case, go to like GaryHabermas.com or uh, watch William Lane Craig and his debates or their presentations. It's, it's all out there. It's great stuff. Um, so James, who, who he went after the death, he still didn't believe, but after the resurrection, seeing Jesus alive, that's the claim, right? He suddenly converted. Um, Paul the Apostle, who had every inclination to be against the church, says that he saw the living Christ, and that was why he became uh, a Christian. So I think, uh, actually, maybe I'll play a little bit longer. I'm not sure if he's done with this, these five, because I, I think we should talk about these five. So these are the, these are like the five points. And if you catch yeah. the underlines, that's. Yeah. Okay. I think he's done. So uh, do you have any comments about any one, any of these five, Cam? I do, but I'll let you go first. 
Um, so I, I, I know <laughs> this is a real quibble, <laughs> but a lot of this is about um, like tone and connotation. Um, but Mike gives number five. I know he's trying to make a um, a point with his uh, alive um, thing, but he says enemies of Christ converted, and one of the examples is James. Um, it's really hard to see James as an enemy. Um, I think that that's probably a little bit too much, but I, I know he's not hanging his case on that point. So, um, yeah, do you want to talk about one? Yeah, number three, um, uh, it's important to see that that we are not given, given a number of how many independent appearances. Was it two? That's plural. Two would be appearances. Three? Thousand? Uh, historians are not agreed on the number. Like that whole 500 thing in uh, Corinthians, historians are not agreed upon that. It's only mentioned once in the New Testament. Um, some think it's an interpolation. Um, so I, I don't know how deep to go in this discussion um, and whether to do it now or whether to do it later, but there's a lot of... What, what would you like me to do, Doug? <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, we already mentioned number five. I think there was only one enemy of Christ, and that's Paul. Uh, if there would have been Pilate, uh, if he would have converted, or even the, the, the what do you call it, the, um, the people who apparently... Jewish Sanhedrin. The Jewish Sanhedrin, but uh, the guards who guarded the tomb, they, they didn't convert according to the gospel narrative. They just took the money and kept quiet, and apparently they saw it. Um, but, and that, which, which guards? Which guards? The Roman guards. Which gospel does that appear in? I think Matthew does it not. Sorry, it, there were guards at the tomb, but it but it doesn't appear in in Mark. <laughs> it, oh, you're right, it doesn't. Hmm, that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> nice one, Cam. Um, number four, the violence endured by the apostles. I remember listening to Bart Ehrman uh, talking to Timothy McGrew about um, the violence. I, I don't know if you remember, Cam, what I'm talking about, which debate that was, but I remember Bart Ehrman saying, you have a really weird view of the violence in that period of time. Like, it's like you think, like, there was blood on the streets every day, and if you said you were a Christian, you were automatically, you know, flogged or something. Yes. Um, I, I think that this view of the apostles being persecuted in such a way that they could have renounced their faith and they would have um, not faced anything is not supported by the evidence. In fact, um, pretty much all of the con uh, all of the persecution persecution stories of the apostles come from much later sources that are unreliable on grounds even other than the stories themselves. Um, you can read a. Uh, excellent book on the subject. Uh, it's by Candida Moss, um, The Myth of Persecution, How Early Christians Invented a Story of Martyrdom. And it covers off all of the uh, evidence from the patristics and um, all of the earliest evidence for martyrdom stories. And I think upon reading that book, your perception of this persecution will change significantly. Yeah. Uh, I've said so much about that on other videos, but um, yeah, they could have been uh, some of the violence could be endured just from sedition and so forth. Uh, but and and it's good to point out the the only ones that even appear in the New Testament are James and Stephen, from my understanding. Yeah, for as far as martyrdom. And, yeah. But yeah, and then, I don't actually think that in those stories we get any indication that had they recanted their belief in the resurrection, uh, that they would have been spared. So um, if people listening in chat who are not Christian, uh, even Muslims, here's some uh, piece of advice. If, you're, if a Christian says violence or martyrdom is evidence of the um, veracity of the Gospels, ask them this question. Uh, how do you know that the 12 disciples, for example, died, or 11 of them at least, 
uh, died from martyrdom for the belief in the resurrection. How do you know that? If they say Bible, you say, oh, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, maybe two at best, or one. Um, it's so maybe we can talk about... Oh, sorry, you go. Yeah, I was just saying, a lot of a lot of this martyrdom stories come from later traditions found in the Apocrypha, which also has a lot of weird stuff right next to it that Christians don't believe. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so on point number two, uh, one um, important thing to point out, if you're unaware, is that the gospel traditions about who actually went to the tomb uh, differ quite significantly. And in fact, the in general, the, the stories of who was at the tomb, um, it, 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 they vary across the gospels. Um, for example, and this is going by memory, so it's a little bit hard to remember. Um, in Mark, we get a pretty simplistic story of, uh, I think, three women, um, Mary. I got it here, the, Ken. Yeah. Um, boy, I'm looking really pale. It's because of the white background, so I'm, I'm healthy. I'm not sick. Don't worry, anybody. But you can pray for me if you want. Uh, women to the tomb. <laughs> <laughs> women to the tomb. Uh, in Mark, it says there's three. In Matthew, it says there's two. In Luke, it says at least four. And in John, it says there's one. So uh, now I totally understand this is not a contradiction. I want to be very clear. But what I will say on point number two here, that ladies find the tomb, that we have at least a little bit of reason to doubt it because the, the narratives are not um, the same. And if you're a Christian who believes this, you have to always go with the bigger number. You're forced to. So how, if, it, if you're well, not... Yeah. And you, you say it's not a contradiction, and I agree with that because in the sense that one doesn't say A and the other one doesn't literally say not A. But is it expected that if there were four women that Mark would say that there were three? Is it expected that if there was one woman that another author would say four? It's not. So, like, if you take one account and then you ask the question, what would I expect to find in another account, assuming that these are reliable, you wouldn't expect them to differ. Um, and I think that's a problem. So it's not a direct contradiction. But there's also other details in the tomb story that d differ. So, for example, in Matthew, uh, when they arrive first at the tomb, um, the, the stone covering the door is still there. This is going from memory, um, whereas in the other Gospels, it's not. It's a pretty big difference. Um, in in Mark, it's a much more simplistic story with like a young man, um, a young boy or a young man there, whereas in Matthew's story, there is this angel that, um, or is it one angel or two angels, um, yeah, interacts again, with the guards. I got it here too, because these are my notes from when I left Christianity. Um uh, in Mark, there was one man at the tomb. In Matthew, there was one angel at the tomb. In Luke, there are two men in the to at the tomb. And in John, there's two angels at the tomb. Now, you, you, know, you could say that the men were actually angels or whatever, but the actual text says one man or... So the, how many... What was, who was at the tomb? Was it one man, one angel, two men, two angels? So already, like, the... I, I think a lot of historians who do think this point is true they they don't actually i think th think that it was ladies but um for the ones who do i think it's because they are trying to um they're trying to uh find plausible things that have could have caused people to think that jesus rose from the dead um but historically, I think that these accounts, uh, they differ wildly um, and they show a significant amount of exaggeration as time goes on as well. Um, another point to make here is that in Ga Gary Habermas's studies, um, which, you know, as I mentioned before, we don't have access to the raw data. Um, or the, his methodology, uh, the the people who are included in his study um, 
appear to be just writers. And it's actually 70 to 75% of writers that agree with point number two. Not historians, you're saying. And that's the... And the, well, I mean, obviously, some of them are historians, but some of them are not. Um, and that's really important because what we're looking at there is that if he's reporting a 70% figure, that means that 30% of people didn't agree with this. And that's not really a consensus. That That's a majority, but it's, it's not a consensus. But it's also further complicated by the fact that this is not a survey or a poll of all historians that are experts in the field of the period in question. This instead is a, um, a catalogue of those people who have directly published on the historical question of the resurrection or the empty tomb. And so already there's quite a selection bias there. And I need to point out another fact is that um, in New Testament studies, the percentage of Christians in the field are actually around 70 percent, um, 70 to 75 percent. So hmm, what do you make of that? Um, also, another fact who, to mention is that me- who have signed a confession yeah. of faith, probably in the seminary that they went to or the or- university or whatever they work. That is correct. A study has been done and published by um, by David Fitzgerald, um, which uh, demonstrates that of the uh, institutions that offer degrees in like biblical studies or New Testament studies, a pretty significant portion of Christian institutions have a statement of faith that require people to affirm um, Christian positions. Okay. Um, making their scholarship pretty questionable, to if you ask me. I want to nail this really carefully and politely, civilly, but I want to nail this down really hard. So Christians, if you're listening, close your eyes and imagine that, that 70% of Muslims who study the Quran for a living say that Muhammad flew to the moon on a winged beast and that they've signed confessions of faith saying that they believe that the Quran is the holy word of Allah. That's basically what we're saying with number two here. Does that hit? You can open your eyes now, by the way, Christian. (laughs) So I, I want to do something else. I want to give a little bit of a sampling of figures in history, um, prior to or around the period of Jesus Christ who have stories told about them in which they vanish or there's a missing body. Okay. Alexander the Great. As a conqueror, uh, as the conqueror's premature death loomed close and he rested in Babylon, he conceived the idea that he should perhaps take his own life by throwing himself in the Euphrates River in order that his body having disappeared, he might be numbered among the gods, thus sustaining his divine myth that he was a demigod, son of Amon Zeus. So uh, Aeneas, son of Aphrodite. Uh, I'm just trying to find the passage. Yeah, I now I, I have a feeling a lot of Christians are going to zone out here because it just doesn't compute. <laughs> um, but, but please just listen to one more at least. Uh, like I, I tried my hardest with Michael uh, with uh, Jonathan McClatchy to really listen to the undesigned coincidence. So to really try to focus on um, on what Cam is saying on the next one. That the point being that this idea of uh, deity or some type of deification and a body missing um, is not uncommon in history. Yeah, it's not. So um, this is just like almost like a random example. Um, Aristraeus, son of Apollo, um, while paying a visit to Dionysus in Thrace and being initiated into the secret rites as the fable related, Aristraeus vanished near Mount Hamus uh, and was never seen again. 
uh, Athenagoras wrote that the Cians worshipped Aristarchus, considering him equal to Zeus and Apollo. So uh, instead of reading more of these things, um, I'm just going to name some names who had vanishing or missing bodies. Uh, Acca Laurentia, um, Aeneas again, uh, Al Al. Uh, Alcmene, um, uh, some of them are so hard to say. Alcyone, uh, you know what, Cam? Maybe, uh, uh Alcimenes. <laughs> maybe, uh, there's so many of them. <laughs> maybe when, uh, I this goes up on video, you can put it a comment like a list that people could verify this for themselves. Um, but we should move on. But this is important, we so should. We but we're spending a lot of time on this because this is the, you know, these things are important. So to, to, I, I apologize for that, but just to understand the logic, if it is the case that it was common for figures of high status to have stories told about them in which their bodies were, uh, f were missing or vanished in some manner, and the same story is told about Jesus. It's not the same. It's a little different. Well, of course. I mean, but the general theme of it is told about Jesus. W what What do you think that that means? Does that change your confidence in whether or not this is a meaningful thing that occurred, a historical thing that occurred, and that it means that he rose from the dead? Yeah, if you're a truth seeker, I would think you would take that into account. Um, I... We haven't mentioned number one. Uh, I could say things about number one too, but I'm willing just to give it, give it to them. <laughs> well, we can we can give it to them, but I would just. I mean, I actually I think that it's like fifty fifty. Um, I think that if he did die, it was by crucifixion. But I would just make one point. The first gospel to claim this is Mark. That's a consensus of experts and a real consensus that Mark wrote first. And in his account, immediately prior to the crucifixion, he tells a story of what is a parallel to a scapegoat ritual mm. where Jesus and another figure, Barabbas, which means son of the father, were pitted against one another for the favor of the Jewish crowds. And Pilate acting in a way that is completely contrary to anything that we know about Roman officials and how they conducted justice under the Roman Empire, he gives the opportunity for the crowd to petition for either one of these figures to be set free. And what do the Jewish crowds do? They demand that Barabbas, son of the father, is set free. And Jesus is crucified despite the fact that Pilate says to, um, in the narrative that he knew that the Jewish um, chief priests only gave him, um, were only implicating him out of envy. Is that, does that sound like a historical story to you? <laughs> yeah. So I, in case uh, some people didn't catch that, I'm going to translate uh, Pine Creek style. Um, Basically, what is more likely that the Yom Kippur story of um, sacrificing one goat, letting one goat free, um, is being sort of like an analogy here, or that it actually happened, uh, given that a really ruthless, bad, bad guy named Pilate let a murderer go free? And how did Pilate know the intentions of the people? Like... Uh, doesn't say it in the text yeah so Pilate was uh quite quite known for his ruthlessness um in fact josephus reports um accounts of him and his uh, r ruthlessness towards i think it was the samaritans okay let's uh let's move on so i uh, play back the the tape if you, anybody who's a Bible geek like uh, Cam and I, or Cam at least, <laughs> and uh, you, you can see why we doubt all five of these things, and uh, why even like Cam said, thirty percent of scholars doubt uh, some of these things. 
Uh, I just want to make one more point. I know I'm belaboring things, but ha have you covered the fact that on point number three, one uh, one thing that Mike really glosses over and doesn't really make any mention of is that the appearances to Paul that he recounts in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Galatians have no similarity whatsoever to the appearances recounted in the Gospels. Good point. And I also want to say, because there's going to be a lot of Christians watching this because we're talking about Mike Winger, and I've said this many times in other videos, but I'll say it here. Uh, for point number two, if you're a Christian who says, oh, well, ladies that came to the tomb, like ladies were nothing back then, so why, that'd be unexpected. Why would ladies, if you're the type of Christian who uses that as an argument, um, please look into why that's a bad argument. And I'm going to tell you why I think, I think it's a bad argument. But then look for, into it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, it, it there is evidence that it's cus it was customary, customary for burial rites for women to go to the tomb. So that would not be unexpected. Also, um, there's that whole concept, the theme in Mark about the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So even if you view women as lower than men, it would make sense that, you know, that, that theme would, would keep going. So... And again, like we said earlier, how many ladies, like, we don't know. It, it's like, you have to say, if you want to say all the Gospels are true, it's at least four. Um, and it's, to me, it'd be unexpected. Yeah. yeah. And it's also claimed that, and this is the embarrassment aspect, or part, actually, I don't think it's quite that, but it's part of the argument that the testimony of ladies were, un, were not valuable. Um, so why would an author invent that aspect of the story? But it turns out that this is actually factually false. Yeah. that um, ladies could actually testify on matters which they were experts on. But more importantly, um, which is the most, th th it's crazy that nobody points this out. Nobody is even remotely considering this idea that the woman would be testifying in court about what they saw. Like, what, what, what are you talking about? Like, women were trusted to report matters to one another. I mean, you know, at varying degrees. But this question is not a question about whether or not women could, um, could testify in a court of law of the day. It's absurd. Okay, let's keep going. But there, we spent time on this because it's important. It just spells out the word alive. Um, A-L-I-V-E. So, a death by crucifixion, ladies find the tomb empty, independent appearances of Jesus alive after death, violence endured by the apostles, the enemies of Christ converted. Now, I uh, I would normally spend a long, I'm trying. long time unpacking each of those. But the bottom line is this. I pretty much want to know, um, oh, and I should mention, if you're watching live, you can put your questions in the comments, and uh, my friend Kirk is monitoring the comments. He will send those questions to me. I will answer those questions at the very end of the live stream. I do ask that you, you offer questions that are specific, that are clear, so that people know when I read the question really what you're asking. Um, and and if, you, if you disagree with me, that's even better. I like those questions the best. Okay, so what are, what are the alternate explanations? Like if I'm going to take these five facts and say, let's just say that these generally agreed upon facts that these are all true. What explains all these facts? Well, obviously the resurrection does. The resurrection explains the not only the death, because you have to have a dead Jesus before you have a live Jesus, right? So it also explains the empty tomb. Um, it explains the independent appearances of Jesus, the violence endured by the apostles, and the enemies of Christ converted. It explains all those things. What else does, though? That's the question. So here's the alternate theories. The alternate theories for Jesus, not, not Jesus, but somebody else, it, some other explanation is the swoon theory. I'm going to give you seven of them. The swoon theory is that Jesus didn't really die. He only looked like he was dead. He was like, if, you, if you're a fan of The Princess Bride, which I think is a fantastic movie, I should probably go watch it again. Um, he was mostly dead, right? He was only mostly dead. He wasn't entirely dead. And, uh, and so then the resurrection wasn't really resurrection. He just kind of, you know, got a little better. Then there's the twin theory. The twin theory would be that, um, that there was... That, gee, I'm not kidding, that Jesus actually had a twin and that the twin was crucified or the twin is the one who came back, one or the other. So one of them died, the other one came back. And this, of course, uh, um, 
yeah, the twin theory. Okay, so then we have the mass hallucination theory. I'll respond to these in a second. First, I'll just lay them out. This is actually the most popular theory even today amongst those who are willing to throw out a theory. It's the mass, is that there were just a lot of hallucinations. I have to stop it there. I'm sorry. I wa really wanted to play more, but I have to stop it there. Um, first of all, I have never met anybody in this century <laughs> who has said the swoon theory or twin theory. Um, uh, although hilariously, I mean, you know, and I don't think that this is plausible at all, although I actually think it's more plausible than the resurrection. <laughs> But I don't support this as an argument. Um, but Josephus does actually, uh, I think it was Josephus, or may maybe it was Tacitus, does report of like a case of somebody um, not dying after having been crucified, being brought down uh, from the cross. Yeah, I think it was Josephus, and actually uh, living on and not actually dying. Um, but, you know, I don't think that that's what happened. So, yeah. Uh, so the point is like, Cam and I's objections or other explanations go far deeper than like, oh, he never really died or, um, or he had a twin. Like, this is, yeah, it's like such simplistic thinking. Yeah, it's, uh, and so I stopped it here on point three though, because um, the, he said mass hallucinations. There does not have to be mass hallucinations f to explain this. Uh, it only has it only has to be maybe one, two, or three, um, and we know. I'll use the word "no." We know that people have uh, hallucinations that are so real. I've I've had one um, that you cannot tell reality from from um, fiction, and it was on Percocet, <laughs> and um, and so and and we know that people who have lost someone that they love will often see their loved ones, uh, not often, but it does happen, will see their loved ones, like they're standing right there, just like I'm looking at Cam right now, except in 3D. So it doesn't have to be a mass hallucination. It can be just a few people saying, I saw Jesus, he came to me, and then the news sort of spreads that Jesus is alive. <laughs> Yeah, and it's um, there's no reason to suppose that the um, the visions or hallucinations or whatever you want to call it, there, there would be no reason to suppose that they had to be identical in their character or in exactly the details of their report. Because we have sociological cases that have been studied of people having hallucinations of similar things and corroborating one another's accounts despite the fact that it wasn't actually real and um, this can occur through a mo variety of means um, especially when um, such uh, states are being led by a kind of leader who um, prompts and primes um, other people who are corroborating the accounts and this is not like a collusion based thing this is just natural human behavior um, especially in extreme circumstances like for example if you um if you uh, are in a situation where you are um like highly suggestible situations, oftentimes the um, the content of your experience can be um, influenced by other people around you. And I don't even think that this happened because I don't actually think that there were um, any hallucinations other than visions of um, p uh, uh, visions from individuals. But yeah, yeah. And I want to point out, uh, and I think every Christian will agree with this, that the first record we have of an appearance of Jesus is from Paul and that's right and Paul it sounds like a vision that apparently happened after Jesus already ascended into heaven that's correct and then we have Paul saying but other people saw Jesus too but I'm talking about the first record we have we don't have any records of someone saying I saw Jesus other than Paul um talking about other people seeing jesus so that's um, correct so i think we I have no first person accounts other than paul and when paul recounts in 
uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he's reciting a creed. Um, he's not reciting evidence from people. He's reciting what people believed. Um, I think it's important to see that difference. But if, for example, your friend told you that they had a vision of their dead loved one, or like that they had, that they saw their dead loved one. Would you suppose that that vision or that you know experience was real? In the sense, not that they're lying about it, but in the sense that it actually was like a physical person that was was real. Um, I, I say you probably wouldn't, and in fact, I think that. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if um, of the many, many claims that Christians still claim today of visions of Jesus, that Mike probably rejects some of them. Um, and if you reject accounts that come from first person people today, why is it that you think that you can tell that it was a real vision when people report it from 2000 years ago and they're not even reporting their own experiences? Well, yeah. And even Paul though, like, so Mike, when you watch the replay, my question would be if a person from uh, Tallahassee says to you, I saw Jesus, he appeared to me. Would you be skeptical of that? And I think you would say yes. Now, why is this person in Tallahassee, who you can go and look in their eyes and, and see, hear from them yourself, see if they're lying or not, why are you skeptical of that person from Tallahassee saying I, they saw Jesus and you're not skeptical of Paul? Exactly. I, I don't see why Paul is considered trustworthy. But uh, sorry, I, I want to draw out that distinction once again that you made before. The only first person account of a, a revelation of Jesus that we find in the New Testament is by Paul. All of the other things are reported by anonymous authors 40 years plus after the events that purportedly occurred. That's important. Very important. I like and that's a consensus of scholarship. M Mike wants to rely on the consensus when he appeals to what he considers five minimal facts, which are um, agreed upon by most historians. Well, I'll tell you what the consensus is. The consensus is, is that all of the, all of the gospel authors don't report um, who they were. They are writing 40 years after the events. They don't identify at all how they are qualified to report what they're reporting and the details that they relate. They don't, they obviously don't tell us who they are or what their methods were. Um, they don't tell us they where they wrote it or and when they wrote they it. They don't tell us they don't critically evaluate any of the information that that they have. At no point in time do they compare traditions that they were receiving, despite the fact that in the case of Luke, we know that he was using Matthew and Mark, who have differing accounts of certain details. Luke knows that. Luke sees that and reads it. Yet when he reports to us, what does he do? He tells a story. He doesn't critically evaluate them, compare them for their ver veracity, and give us an assessment as to why he chose one over the other, which is what a good historian of the ancient world would have done. But Mike, but um, uh, uh, sorry, but Cam, um, um, but that's not the way they did things back then. Well, <laughs> and I've addressed this in a live stream before, but while it's true that um, the standards of historiography, of historical writing, was not as good as what our historical writing is today, nonetheless, there are authors who do critically evaluate their sources, report who they were, report why they're qualified to relate the details that they do, and they um, even express skepticism on things that are less well attested. Um, sometimes they even give eyewitness accounts in the first person of things they directly experienced. Yeah, I, I just, I'm going to say this as gently as I can. I've read for myself 
the prologues for Dionysius and Suetonius. And a lot of Christians say that Luke was, you know, the, the most, um, I don't know, the best historian of the four Gospels. Um, Luke is really terrible. Luke compared, was, yeah, Luke he was, was terrible. He was terrible compared to those two guys in the same time period. In fact, in fact Dionysius was before. Um, but let's keep going. Um, yeah, so. And so we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> Then there's the spiritual resurrection theory. Uh, some liberal scholars in particular believe that Jesus didn't rise bodily. He just sort of had some sort of difficult to describe spiritual resurrection experience. And there's a lot of things that come against that, but we'll come back to it. Then there's the wrong tomb theory, which is to say that they just got the wrong tomb. Um, you know, the, he was buried in one tomb, but they went to a different tomb later and they opened it. It was empty and that kind of triggered everything else. Oops, just like a, just like kind of like a GPS malfunction. And then, uh, I want to also say that the earliest uh, writings we have, uh, are Paul's and Paul never even mentions the tomb. And how many gospels even mention Joseph of Arimathea? Is it two or do all four? I think Luke doesn't, but Matthew and Mark both do. I'm kind of try I'm trying to remember of John, but, um, yeah, Luke doesn't. So there's some doubt, and I think that there's a good there's a good case to be made that the story of uh, Joseph of Arimathea is actually um, modelled uh, off the story of um, uh, Hector's father Priam or whatever his name is uh, going to request the body of uh, Hector um, after Hector dies. And um, I mean, I'm not going to argue for this now, and you can you can read. Uh, uh, Dennis McDonald and the relevant literature on this. Yeah. But you know what? I just got to throw this in. I, what really saddens me is um, there's going to be, if Christians can honestly sit and listen to us talk here, there's going to be a lot of them who are hearing this for the first time. And that's what really saddens me. Um, yeah. Well, th this is an opportunity. Bryson asks, uh, how is that not an argument from silence? I I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. Um, but one thing, uh, it's commonly thought that arguments from silence aren't valid, but uh, they are in uh, when certain criteria is met. For example, when you strongly expect to observe certain evidence and then you don't observe it, that counts as evidence against the claim that it was true. So, for example, if I claim to you that I have an elephant sitting behind me and then I move out the way and adjust my camera and you see that there's not an African elephant sitting behind me, you know exactly what you expected. You didn't observe it, and so it's evidence against. Now, argument, arguments from silence don't work when there's no reason to expect that we would yeah. actually observe the evidence. Yeah, uh, like argument from silence is extremely powerful when you would expect something. So uh, I claim, I, I live in Los Angeles right now. This is a hypothetical. I claim the most, the, the record uh, earthquake just happened uh, an hour ago. Records. It was like the biggest earthquake I've ever experienced in my uh, condo. No newspapers reported it. No radio stations reported it. No other human being in Los Angeles reported it. Argument from silence that claim that I experienced the biggest earthquake in LA is probably bogus. Sort of like three hour darkness. <laughs> yeah, so Bryson clarified the tomb not being mentioned by Paul means that the tomb wasn't empty. No, that is that is not the claim. There's no claim of implication, a claim that because he didn't mention it, therefore it means that definitely it was empty. It's that if there really were an empty tomb, we would expect it. It's reasonable to expect that it would be mentioned in our earliest source, Paul, when he's discussing the resurrection itself. Yeah, and I realize Christians say, well, it's implied, so it's, but it still... So it's evidence against. It's, it's not an implication that it must be true that there was no empty tomb. 
It's nothing like that. It's just evidence against. It's like your confidence at one point in time was here, and then it just dropped a bit. Okay, well, let's move on. Then we have the missing body theory, and the missing body theory is just that Jesus's body um, was was just missing. Like for some reason, his body was gone. His body was missing. Maybe it was never even put in the tomb in the first place. It was thrown into a common grave, and then his body was gone. And so then it led to all these different things. And then finally, we have the conspiracy theory, which is um, probably the oldest of the theories. This conspiracy theory goes back to the first century, we know, because it's in the mouth of the enemies of the uh, of the gospel when, uh, when, when the gospel writers are writing and they're saying, yeah, the story that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, that that didn't happen because such and such. So they're actually combating this theory. That, that theory goes back to the first century. The conspiracy theory. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a deliberate conspiracy. The apostles purposely lied. You know, Paul, James, these guys, they just lied about it. So those are independent or separate theories, explanations. Let's look at them one at a time. So the swoon theory. Now, now follow me here. If anybody's maybe got a little lost in the mix here. We're going to now take the five facts and compare them to these alternate theories. Do any of these theories withstand the five accepted, generally accepted facts of history, meaning that they would explain away the resurrection? The swoon theory, um, well, that's refuted by a couple different things. Number one, it's refuted by the death by crucifixion. The, the reason why number one is up there is because the description of the crucifixion as well as the piercing and the, the specific details about it if we're only taking the New Testament as as historians do, not as religious people do, right? Just historians take it. Then we say, no, that would be a death. Like you died. Um, but it's also refuted um, by the ascension because um, independent appearances of Jesus alive after his death and his going up into heaven and the type and manner of the, des the description of those appearances. Oh, I have to, I sorry, I have to stop it there. Going up to heaven is heaven up. Sorry. Yeah. So just like I mentioned that there are many vanishing body stories about uh, figures in the past that were considered to be divine, there are also many ascension stories or apotheosis narratives about them too. And two prime examples are Her uh, Heracles or Hercules and um, Romulus. I, I also... Um, I, I want to emphasize the point again that these are like really, really bad explanations um, in in that like they're, they're, yeah, they're just, it's like it's straight out of the 19th or the 18th century. Um, but uh, he's actually missing one important uh, explanation, which is actually... Uh, analyzed and covered in Gary Habermas's work and Mike Lycona's work on the case for the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, that is the, the claim that it's legendary. Um, so it's not like a conspiracy, like a mass conspiracy, but it's instead that these like in that these details were actually later invented by gospel authors or through the process of oral tradition. Yeah. And we, that's why we spent so much time on those first five. So basically, what we're saying is um, we've given reasons earlier. Did something just happen? Uh, we gave reasons earlier about um, why we can doubt all five of those. I'll give them number one. That's fine. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and so it's kind of like going through each of these swoon theory, twin theory, like I, I would never <laughs> use these alternate expl explanations except, and Mike was right, the hallucination theory. Uh, but again, I would say, you know, it could have been just been visions and I definitely don't think it, it has to be mass. It can be one at a time. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> but even then, I just want to point out once again, we have actual historical, like, good evidence that people do have um, hallucinations in groups. I think mass is kind of a, you know, it's it's meant to make it sound even more implausible. But um, we do actually have cases of hallucination in groups, but carry on. Appearances don't describe a weak, impotent, barely alive almost killed like you were so badly hurt we thought you were dead you laid alone in, in in a tomb for three days somehow you got out 
this doesn't inspire the faith of the disciples, the appearances of him alive after death don't match this. And of course, number four, what I just said is it's not inspiring. The violence endured by the apostles don't, doesn't make sense if Jesus was just um, hurt really bad, but not dead. Um, so it, the swoon theory isn't supported by hardly anybody uh, for this reason. Then we have the twin theory. The twin theory, of course, would be, um, would be refuted by a couple things. So we have... Um, the empty tomb, number two, if the, if there was a twin that died, there would be. I, I'm tempted just to fast forward this because we don't like, uh, we agree with Mike that these are bad theories. So, um, but I'm scared to try to fast forward because then I got to make sure I get the right spot. Uh, what do you think, Cam? Should I just let it play or fast forward all this? I, th I think let it play. Okay be two bodies, not one. So the empty tomb doesn't make sense. The um, independent, independent appearances of Jesus alive after death are to not strangers that he appeared to some strangers or people didn't know him well, but they're also to like those who are following with him every day for years, for years, every day in and out living with Jesus. Then we have um, his, his family, his mom, his, his brother, like number five enemies of Christ converted. That doesn't get explained. So, now there's longer refutations of these. I'm just giving you a couple. He's kind of introducing other claims there, which go well beyond what any kind of consensus holds um, on his independent appearances thing. So, like, there's, I think that there's very few scholars that actually believe, um, well, I shouldn't say few, but uh, there are, there are many, many arguments against and many uh cases in published literature against stories like the um uh the road to emmaus for example in luke and the the fishing scene in john and um the many of the post-resurrection appearances that are reported in the gospels are significantly doubted by historians yeah so it's not like as if like all of the stories in the gospels that scholars all believe that which is kind of what it makes it sound like when mike describes it yeah and and even christian historians don't say everything in the gospels happened that purports that it happened i won't mention any names <laughs> a couple a uh, couple points because i want to get into you know hume and barker and, and all those guys in a second so um the tw the twin theory then we have the mass hallucination theory and and this is um richard carrier you, he likes to borrow pieces from the mass hallucination theory um but this is also going to be refuted um by the number three independent accounts of jesus alive after death not one time but multiple different people on multiple different occasions that doesn't fit mass hallucinations as well as several individuals at one location where they're all seeing the same thing at the same time the idea behind a hallucination is it only happens in here right so when we're all experiencing the same thing out here that is not a hallucination that's the only that's how you know it's not a hallucination hey do you see that too yes i do okay it's not a hallucination yeah um we don't have that we don't have multiple independent people saying the same thing we have reports Oh, you dropped off, Doug. Okay, can you still hear me? I can hear you, but the video dropped off. Why is that? Keep talking. Yeah, I think that it's just misleading what he's claiming. Um, I mean, yeah, the Gospels report uh multiple uh cases uh, you're back um m multiple cases of appearances we all agree on that that is what the gospels describe but this idea that we have independent attestation to um to multiple appearances that are the same that is just false yeah it's one of those things where like i i know when i was a christian you're you're indoctrinated you're um you're just it's so ingrained to in you that when you read the bible it's talking about history that it oh if it says this then that, that happened but only paul had this vision 
that he says, Hi, my name is Paul. I had a vision. Did any of the disciples say that? That we said, that said, Hi, my name is Matthew, and I saw Jesus. We don't have that. Now, I know some Christians claim that we have that, but the only reason why we think Matthew wrote Matthew is because of someone 95 years after um, said, Oh, yeah, uh, Matthew said that. Well, I mean, it's even worse because in Papias, when he, uh, as reported, um, he actually claims that Matthew was written in Hebrew, if I if I'm remembering correctly, uh, which we have no reason at all to think that the Gospel uh, Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. So it's not even identifying the same source. Yeah, and, and other extra biblical stuff like Tacitus and Josephus and so forth. Um, again, we're not sure what their sources are. It'd be like a historian in the late 1800s talking about um, Mormonism and reporting what the Mormons believed back then. Um, is it well, it's also, it's also irrelevant to whether or not Jesus rose from the dead because they didn't. Yeah, um, they didn't talk about like, it. We, we've got no reason to think that they were reporting any evidence of that. Right, they're just talking about um, what was believed back then. Um, okay, I think seems to be working normally again. Let's press play. Can, can I? Um, so that, that, yep. go. Can I give one more thing for people to consider? Sure. So, as I mentioned before, Mike's relying on the consensus. The consensus of scholars is that Mark's gospel was written first and that it wasn't written by an eyewitness, but instead was written by, it, it is anonymous and we don't know who the author was. And we get to an important scene within the gospel where Jesus um, is uh, on the cross and, uh, and the events are occurring ar around Jesus' crucifixion. And consider the following. This is a quote from uh, Price's work, Holy Fable. The crucifixion scene in Mark 15 is essentially a narrative fleshing out Psalm 22. All of the major bullet points, quote, come from that psalm, though Mark never calls attention to his source. He says nothing to imply these, quote, events are fulfillments of some prediction encoded in Psalm 22. So, for example... The piercing of Jesus' extremities reflects Psalm 22, 16. The parceling out of his garments and throwing dice for them uh, in Mark 15, 22 derives from Psalm 22:18. The wagging heads of the mockers are from Psalm 22, 7. And the keynote cry of abandonment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, is a direct quotation of Psalm twenty two one. Right. So, let me let me spell out what Cam's saying. Cam is saying, and I agree with him, that it's more likely that those events did not take place at all, but an author was using the Psalms to create a narrative. Now, even take the piercing one uh, in Psalm uh, twenty two. If you go back to Psalm. 22 it's talking about lions biting into flesh did, did a lion bite into jesus it does it doesn't talk about nails going through hands and so forth and so it's also not even a prophecy like if you go and read psalm 22 it, there's nothing that indicates it's actually about something else yeah so and, and, and so to, to get clear here there was a known practice of what was called midrash of the time where people were using details from ancient um, Hebrew texts, like the Psalms, to actually create new narratives or new theologies or new interpretations of these scriptures. And not only that, in the first century, if you went through a Greek education, you learned the practice of taking existing, story, existing stories and using them to craft narratives with new characters and new meanings. This was an established known practice in the first century, which many authors used, in, for example, Virgil in his Aeneid. And 
So it's not a ridiculous claim, like this idea that people use details from the Old Testament, whereas what is a ridiculous ridiculous claim? claim? That hundreds of years before, an author was somehow predicting or echoing things that would occur in the first century of Jesus, and that God divinely orchestrated these events in order to make it so Jesus's crucifixion reflected some ancient text that the Jews knew of. That is not plausible. Well, that is not plausible at all. And I understand the Christian's um, sort of reply to that, and that is, well, we believe God is the author of the whole Bible, and it would only make sense that he is uh, telling us a consistent story from Psalms all the way to the Gospels, and so there's no problem here. But I, I'll just tell you my perspective. My perspective is that if I care about what's true and I ask myself the what's more likely question, what's more likely that um, you know the piercing of the hands and that language found in the Gospels actually happened or that a anonymous person who we don't know where he wrote from and we're not exactly sure when he wrote it, but the scholarly consensus is a lifetime later, 40 years is a lifetime back then, um, used the Old Testament to create a narrative. Then, and maybe it was loosely based on a real guy. Who knows? But anyway, we really need to press play. Otherwise, it's going to be like three hours. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, later. we're never going to get through it. <laughs> it doesn't easily work. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, which goes back to within five years of the resurrection. It talks about how over 500 at once saw Jesus. So we're talking about quite a mass of hallucinations. Oh, I, I'm sorry, guys. I have to stop it here. Uh, um, it's a claim that 500 people saw Jesus. It's a claim only made once in all the New Testament. Later on in this video, I asked Mike directly, do you lower your confidence in a claim that only has one source? And he said, yes. So this 500 witnesses deal, I think by Mike's own admission, he would have lower confidence on than other claims uh, in, the, in the New Testament. Um, and when he talks about going back to within five years, let's be very clear what Mike's talking about here. He's not saying that this was written five years after. He's saying that this, that there's a, a creed, a claim um, that, that may go back that close, but that is written uh, two decades later about this, this set of beliefs. You want to say anything, Cam? <laughs> Yeah, it, that's an important distinction to make. First Corinthians 15 itself is not from, um, well, First Corinthians in general is not from five years after. Um, but scholars uh, have made arguments for dating the specific creed um, in First Corinthians 15 to being close to, to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, here we go. Uh, being being claimed here so that 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 explanation doesn't seem to work very well then there's the wrong tomb theory um the the wrong tomb theory or excuse me the spiritual resurrection theory the spiritual resurrection theory which this is honestly this is what irritates me about how sometimes theological liberals will talk because they will on one hand say i'm a christian and on the other hand, then they deny core doctrines of Christianity. But then they say, no, 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 it's never really been that important. And then they talk in wishy-washy terms and they make it all into poetry. And then they like, I think they irritate everybody. Um, I mean, I'm not emotionally mad at them. I just, it's just like, how are you to arrive at truth when you treat truth like it's, like it's a contortionist? Um, so the spiritual resurrection theory is kind of like that. Like there was something of a resurrection, but, but this doesn't fit the empty tomb. The body was raised. The body of Christ was actually raised. That doesn't fit the empty tomb. The, there was violence endured by the apostles. That The reason why they endured the, vi the violence is because they believed in the physical resurrection. And this gets into the very meaning of the word resurrection. N.T. Wright has done a lot of study on the actual meaning of the word resurrection to first century people, to the Jews in particular, because this is a Jewish movement, remember. And there's no way that the word meant a spiritual resurrection. That's not what the word meant. And so N.T. Wright's got a, a ton of work he's done on that. And um, uh, some people who used to say this now agree uh, with him. So the spiritual resurrection theory doesn't fit those, those facts either. Then we have, um, what's next? We have the missing, uh, the wrong tomb 
Wrong tomb theory. It's refuted by a uh, description of the tomb given both in the before and the after. The um, number three, four, and five, independent appearance of Jesus alive after death. That doesn't happen when you just got his, you lost his body. You don't endure violence because of those things. And the enemies of Christ don't get converted because you can't find the body of Jesus. They could have easily just brought the body back out at any point later. Um, and then we have the uh, missing body theory. And this again is refuted by three, four, and five. Independent appearances don't happen when the body of Jesus is just missing. Then we're back to just a hallucination theory, um, which has its own issues. The violence endured by the apostles doesn't happen because of that. The enemies of Christ aren't converted because of uh, the body was missing. And then the conspiracy theory, which which is basically like wrong tomb, missing body combined. The problems with the conspiracy theory are all the same as the problems we've, we've mentioned so far. Um, it just adds that the disciples knowingly, intentionally did all this on purpose, like, right. Knowing it was a lie. So they knowingly died. I mean, the mass hallucination theory has to do with them being deceived. The conspiracy theory has to do with them purposely lying and deceiving people about it, but it doesn't bear up. They, they gained, they gained nothing. They lost everything. And it was all because of the claim about the resurrection and that they did. Um, so th that, that, those are the historical facts compared to the alternate explanations. This is all just the intro. We're, get, we're about to get to the good stuff. So <laughs> then we have the one rational explanation, which in my mind is Jesus is alive. You muted. I mean, does Jesus being alive explain the crucifixion? You the, muted. The tomb? Sorry about that. I was going to say that uh, Mike said that this has been a long introduction, but I thank him for that because this is very, very important stuff. This is, sets the groundwork the appearances, the violence, and even the enemies of Christ being converted. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus being alive explains all that. Okay. So that's the quick rundown, the brrr, fast. And, and of course, I mean, I, I fully admit you guys, I've lost some details in here. There's, there's a better case that can be made, um, for and against the things I just am giving you a quick summary. And the reason is because now I want to talk about specific skeptics and how they react to the evidence for the resurrection. He's talking about us. So David Hume, oh, David thought... Hume is, let me show you him right here. There oh. he is. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's not modern. He's not as current, right? But he is used by all the modern guys and used by all the current guys. And if you get into a debate on the resurrection, this, this guy, this guy is going to come up in that debate. David Hume will pop up in that conversation. David Hume lived in the 1700s and he was a philosopher and he says about the resurrection that it didn't happen. And here's his reason, not because he has a better explanation, but because any explanation is better in his mind. Let me explain. In David Hume's mind, miracles are impossible, period, end of story. And therefore, no matter what the evidence is, we deny the resurrection. I uh, I know what you're going to say, Cam, but I think he, I'm going to give Mike some some rope here, a slack, because I think he corrects himself a little later on about what he I think said. he does as well. Yeah. But it doesn't excuse having made a pretty much the first claim that he makes about Hume is false, um, because Hume doesn't claim that they're impossible. What Hume actually specifically claims is that were there to be a counterproof. Um, f f uh, which is proof against the uniform operating of nature, that counterproof would have to be more miraculous than the claim itself. That might be confusing to you, but what he's effectively saying is that the improbability of the evidence against the claim um, or oh, sorry, for the claim, it has to be higher than the improbability of the claim itself. Yeah, what Hume is saying that if there's a miracle claim, to disbelieve it would take even more of a miracle. How's that for a summary? Well, no, I, yeah, maybe. But what what he's trying to say is that um, the type of evidence that we need to have would be evidence that is more miraculous than the claim itself. Yeah. Okay. So, and when he's using miracle there, it's not quite precise because he doesn't mean that it's a violation of nature, that the evidence itself is a violation of nature. What he's trying to say is that um, the character of such evidence um, 
would need to be like incredibly improbable to have if the claim uh, were uh, true. Yeah, and um, so I, yeah, I get a little tired of people accusing me. Sorry, weren't sorry, weren't true. I get a little tired of people accusing me. Oh, Doug, you're just a rabid fundamentalist, um, presuppositionalist against miracles. No, I look into my eyes. I would love to see a miracle. Now, I admit I have high standards for miracles, like lengthening one leg and having your back pain go away. I don't count as a miracle. Uh, <laughs> it can be easily explained other ways. But you produce something out of thin air over and over again. You grow a limb from an amputee. I would love to see that. Um, so my standard of miracles is very high. And I do consider uh, resurrection an amazing miracle. But what is more probable, what is more likely that a man rose from the dead or a book just says that he did in bodily form? I yeah, I mean, so Hume, just to clarify on Hume, he, he does say that... Um, testimonial evidence would never rise to the degree of unexpectedness required to substantiate a miracle. Uh, he does say that, um, which is a similar claim to what Ehrman makes later on in the video, but carry on. That is his position. Let me read to you one of the things he wrote. He says, the plain consequence is, and it's a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle. That's his general maxim. That's his position. There is no such thing as enough evidence to say that Jesus rose. You'd be surprised how many people today hold the same position. Okay. Is that bad to hold that position? Um, I think it depends on whether or not you confuse or, uh, you know, have a confusion about what Hume is claiming. Um, so he's not claiming there that there could be no evidence that substantiates a miracle. He's claiming that a particular type of evidence, testimonial yeah. evidence, couldn't meet that burden. Um, I tend to agree with him, um, except for some scenarios that I can construct, which actually do rise to the, to the degree of being more improbable. And like, I'll give you an example. So if upon Jesus' re resurrection, Jesus, instead of appearing to a select group of followers and one outside individual, Paul, Paul, if instead he actually appeared to everybody in the world at that point in time, including, for example, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, some people in China, some people in the Americas, and people geographically separated and told those people his message and his gospel and what salvation meant um, and what he did to achieve it. Though, if those people independently recorded it and they wrote it down in such a way that there were many, many, many witnesses geographically independent from one another such that we couldn't expect that they would have influenced each other, Okay, I, I, I actually I, think, yeah, that's great. That's better, right? It's better testimonial evidence. And I think Christians, if you're listening to this, I think you agree with that. I think what you agree that what Cam's saying, that if Jesus would have simply appeared to a pilot, the Sanhedrin, if he would appear to uh, Chinese people, uh, Aztec, or people uh, in uh, South America, North America, all around the world, and anybody who had the ability to write wrote about it. That is better than what we have now. And I think most Christians would agree with that. But I want to get to the miracle part of, I just thought of this the other day. I th believe that miracles are possible. So if I think about the resurrection, Me too. so if I think about the resurrection narrative, Jesus could have said, you know what? In the future, there's going to be iPads, iPods, cam video cameras, audio. I'm going to go poof and have all that technology here for you disciples. All you have to do is press this button, Peter. Uh, uh, James, come over here. You see this? This is how you focus. This is how you zoom. And, uh, and then I want you to um, record some of my ministry and stuff like this. 
now I can just I can just I can hear the Christians screaming at me right now saying Doug don't be ridiculous this is like a fantastical miracle it's not a plausible miracle but why not if we're if we're truly open to the idea of miracles why didn't Jesus record the t the technology for the the modern era where we have this type of technology and preserve it where we could actually from different uh, audio devices play back and even could carbon date it and so forth. Carbon dating is pretty accurate for only 2,000 years and say, oh, yeah, this is comes back. The little tape inside is like that 2,000 years old. And um, yeah, if miracles can happen, that would have been a great miracle to do. So to verify, that would have been better than what we have. Yeah, and I, I would, I mean, there are a variety of things that I could think of that would make me believe the resurrection. Um, and I'm not against it because, to be perfectly honest with you, I would love there to be an afterlife. I, I would love um, That's where we there disagree. to be. <laughs> well, yeah, you might disagree with that, but I actually want to live forever. And, I mean, I think that the idea of um, worshipping God incessantly forever, if that's what's implied or that's what's true, that kind of sounds a bit weird to me. It might take me some time to get used to that. <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe I could make an app that worships God. I just, why like, would you want to go? And... <laughs> why would you ever want to go to a party that you can't leave? <laughs> well, I can probably create my own party <laughs> in such a world. I mean, I don't know, but like uh, I, I want to believe it. Um, I think it's an amazing Cam, idea. This, you're, you're, this too, you're too smart of a guy. If you go to heaven, if heaven's real, and if you end up there for some strange reason, <laughs> uh, you're going to be walking on the streets of gold, and you're going to be saying, hmm, there has to be something after this. <laughs> there has to be a, <laughs> an after afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, but... Like, I, I'm not against it. And I definitely think that miracles are possible. Like, I don't hold any type of epistemic position where I rule out these things as being impossible a priori. And I pretty much never have. I don't even adhere to what's called methodological naturalism. I actually think we can evaluate these hypotheses and consider them seriously. I just find them wanting. Here we go. So um, if you're the skeptic and you're watching, I want you to notice the commonalities between Hume, Ehrman, Carrier, Barker, all the guys I'm going to talk about. Because it is a blind faith position of methodological naturalism. I do not say that as an insult. I say it as an observation. And tell me if you do not notice the same thing. So uh, David Hume goes on and he says the only time he'd accept a miracle is if there was two competing miracle claims and he would take the lesser of the two. That's the only time he'd accept a miracle. That's he wrote in uh, an inquiry concerning human understanding. That's not what he says. <laughs> That's to misunderstand the point of what Hume says. And I described it earlier. He's not saying that there are two competing miracle claims and he would accept the lesser of them. What he's saying is that the evidence we would need would need to be more miraculous than the claim itself. It's when we're left in a position where um one thing is more unexpected than the other thing uh, i don't know if that makes sense to anybody but it's not what mike just said yeah and i uh would consider myself a naturalist but i also am a naturalist who is open to the idea of miracles and an afterlife and all that stuff i'm open to that so it's it's like well anyhow here we go we already talked about that so that was david hume then we have uh bart ehrman Bart Ehrman is one of the, look, if you're an atheist, you know who Bart Ehrman is, right? If, if you're, um, if you're, in fact, if you're Islamic, you know who Bart Ehrman is because a lot of his stuff is geared towards attacking the Bible and Islamic apologetics requires attacking the Bible. So Bart Ehrman, um, he basically responds to this evidence by hand waving and he's done debates on it. He's done debates and you can, and I, I'd encourage you guys to check them out. I love watching debates personally. But the, the trick is following the arguments, like tracking with the actual arguments. So Bart Ehrman, he says um, that the biggest reason why we should not, the singular reason, the most important reason why we should not believe that this evidence says Jesus rose is because miracles shouldn't be believed 
even if they happened. Did you hear me? I'm not making this up. This is Bart Ehrman's position. Even if they really happened in history, miracles should not be believed. It's, uh, uh, Mike, I was just, if you watch the replay, I need to know, is that a quote? I don't remember uh, Bart using the word belief. I think what Bart's saying here is that the job of a historian is to try to figure out what probably happened in the past. And if miracles, by definition, are the least probable event, then for a historian to make the claim that a miracle probably happened is contradictory. So I don't agree with Ehrman there, um, and I don't. But did Ehrman actually because, quote, is that a quote or is that like a paraphrase? I, maybe he quoted him, I don't know. So Ehrman does claim is something like this, but I think that uh, Mike has got a little bit confused on it, and I'll explain it if, if you're interested. So... Um, Ehrman's claim there is wrong because um, it's like an a priori approach where um, it, it, it might be true that uh, the prior probability of the miracle is the least likely thing. That might actually be true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the posterior probability or like the probability after evaluating the evidence is necessarily still the least probable thing so do you do you understand what i mean like it, it's like it's taking the um the first uh the the prior analysis and then it's equating it with the post analysis it's kind of like we didn't think that um you know, we didn't think that the Higgs boson existed. And then after we got all the data from CERN, uh, we still didn't think the Higgs boson existed. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but like it's, it, you can actually change your mind. If something starts as the least probable thing, it doesn't mean it will end up one, but it just turns out that usually it ends up still <laughs> least probable thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get the sense, and maybe this is not Mike's intention, but I get the sense it's like sort of trying to demonstrate why these certain historians are biased against. They just they just really don't want to believe this, and that's why they say the things they do. Well, let, let's just state a fact. There have been billions of humans who have lived and died, and as far as we know, excluding the claims that Christians make, no individual has been demonstrated to actually have been raised from the dead three days after their death. Now, that's not controversial. People usually don't rise from the dead. And for what we understand about biology and what we understand about physics, such an occurrence would constitute a violation of what we understand of the way nature works. And... It's so it's not as if our skepticism is unhealthy when a claim like this is made. It's a very improbable claim. And maybe Mike wants to dispute that, but I will go to I will go to the mat and the mud to defend my assertion that this is an improbable claim. Does that not sound like a religious position to you? This is Bart Ehrman, right? Even if it happened, it shouldn't be believed. He says, he says this. Now, in his, he had a debate with, um, with William Lane Craig where he granted all of the facts. And William Lane Craig had the same facts as me, pretty much. He just phrased them differently. I put them into an acronym so it's easy to remember alive. Um, and so Bart Ehrman actually granted all these facts, but how did he respond to it? He just said, as a historian, you're not allowed to postulate miracles. It's just wrong. Like, you just can't. So there was no miracle. So what's interesting is after that debate, Bart Ehrman changed his position and now he no longer grants all the facts. He now denies the burial. He thinks that Jesus' body was thrown into a common grave. And I think it's pretty clear, or at least it seems clear to me, um, that the most likely reason why Bart Ehrman did this is because the evidence was so strongly pointing to the resurrection that he decided he couldn't grant all those facts. It would push you towards the resurrection. He had even taught previous students of his, don't try to come up with an alternate theory because they will tear you apart, right? If, if you use the hallucination theory or the, or the swoon theory, he goes, don't do that. They'll tear you apart with the evidence. 
So, uh, so I, his way finally around it after I think being. No, they'll tear you apart because it's like 19th century apologetics. Uh, I mean, our theories. It's that's not the reason. It's just those yeah, bad, I mean, those uh, are bad ex explanations. I I like Ehrman a lot. I think he's a great scholar. I think he's excellent at summarizing what are mainstream positions in the field, and he's also done incredibly valuable original research. For example, in forgery and counterforgery and orthodox corruption of scripture but i i don't agree with him epistemologically like in in terms of epistemology because um the idea that uh certain conclusions can't be reached um via our methods it might be true like in a practical sense that like typically our methods can't get to a certain type of conclusion, but it's not an in principle reason. Um, we could have miracles that occurred in history that we have sufficient historical evidence to, to substantiate them. It just, in my opinion, turns out to be the case that we don't. Pinned um, the wall by guys like, um, William Lane Craig getting to the point where now Bart Ehrman is just saying, Hey, look, I've got, I've got a, a presupposition that Jesus didn't rise. I mean, so what's the point in a debate when you just start with a presupposition and then, uh, his, his way around that now is to say, Oh no, no, the, the empty tomb is not, is not historical. The, there was no tomb, which starts to get a little more, uh, complicated and a little bit at, it's a little ad hoc if you ask me. So he now denies the burial. Um, and I think, for self-serving reasons. So let's look at the next one, Richard Carrier. I got to talk about Richard Carrier. It's not because he's so highly respected. It's look, I'm like you guys, like I live in the world where I'm not just familiar with all the ancient German guys, <laughs> but, but I also I'm online and I see the debates and I see the discussions and I encounter atheists for years now online. And I see the people that they're looking up to and that they're quoting all the time. A guy that's getting quoted more and more nowadays is this guy right here, Richard Carrier. Richard Carrier has multiple cases against the resurrection. So his response to these facts of history is to deny all five facts. He says, he denies not only those five, he denies a lot more. Richard Carrier says Jesus didn't exist at all. That it's a myth. He's what's called a mythicist. That's false. I had Richard Carrier on my live stream. He does not say Jesus didn't exist at all. It's He says that he's very much a Bayesian mathematical type guy. He says the odds are against it. He says that he's 33% uh, chance that he existed based on the evidence, 66% chance that he didn't. Not only that, I think that Mike's tactics here are quite transparent and I think disingenuous because it's a, I think that this constitutes a poisoning of the well. Carrier's views on whether or not Jesus did or did not exist have very little bearing on what arguments he gives for whether or not Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that's an important point to make. And so I think it's mostly a method to... Um, to yeah, like poison the well and discredit whatever positions he has. I must also say, and I actually think some Christians are going to agree with me on this one, but they're going to think it's very, very bad. But um, let's see, 30, 40, 40, 50 years ago, the consensus of scholarship was that Abraham and Moses existed. And in, in the what, 70s and 80s, that changed. Now the consensus of scholarship is that Moses and Abraham probably didn't exist. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 50 to 100 years, we'll probably be dead, so we can't verify this, but that Jesus is going to go that way. What do you think of that prediction, Cam? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. It's a hard thing. I, I, I think that we'll see more scholars in the field uh, adopting this position, um, or at least agnosticism. What we've already seen, um, not because of the publication of Richard's um, book, but because of a general rising uh, skepticism toward uh, the claims of the Gospels, and in particular, an understanding of the use of fiction within um, the period in question, 
we have seen a rise of agnostics in the field. So we now have around eight fully qualified um, historians who have PhDs who are on record um, giving the position of agnosticism or outright mythicism. Um, now, that's obviously a minority. It's a significant minority. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I'm uh, agnostic myself, because uh, despite having um, read a lot of the literature from mythicists and historicists, I kind of find myself unsure. But, yeah. Yeah, and for the record, I think we will we'll see an increase. And for the record, for people watching, I, I lean towards that Jesus did exist. Um, but anyhow, here we go. He's one of the very small number of guys who, who actually is credentialed, who believes Jesus didn't exist. A very, very, I mean, minutely small number um, of guys in that particular position. And they don't generally agree with each other either. So you can't really lump them together like they have the same theories. They're sort of all um, islands. But in his, in his denial, what he has to do is he has to take the evidence that causes people to believe those five facts and he has to reinterpret it. So how does Richard Carrier deal with that evidence? Well, he starts to come up with not one theory, but an amalgam, like a Frankenstein theory. I got to do more stuff on Richard Carrier in the future. But let me just give you a couple of the things that he believes. He teaches that Paul, the apostle, in 1 Corinthians 15, that Paul's saying that Jesus did come and die and rise again, but it all happened in outer space. In outer space. And he seriously means it. He teaches that this stuff happened in outer space. And that's why there was no physical Jesus with a physical death and resurrection. It all happened. Sorry, I kind of cut uh, Mike off. Um, uh, you notice how, Mike, you say outer space. Like, seriously, isn't that goofy? Outer space? It wasn't goofy, Mike. It wasn't goofy at all. People back, a lot of, go ahead, Kim. Uh, yeah, I just can't wait for Mike to do his um, video on the the cosmology of the ancient Near East, because I think that if he's honest with the scholarship, what he will discover is that it was quite a common belief within um, the ancient Near East and even up until uh, within the first century of these con concentric spheres of heavens, which actually had... Um, you know, events that occurred within them. For example, Satan and demons acting in these places. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not a... Well, I mean, even within the New Testament, we see this idea attested in Paul's writings himself, where he, um, you know, talks about somebody in Christ, which, you know, most scholars take to be himself, um, you know, was actually caught up to the third heaven where he witnessed these various things. Yeah, I just want to say, like, the flat earthers, that model, I don't know if you guys have seen the model that the flat, flat earthers have, but wh where do you think they got that from? This just didn't pop in their head. This is from ancient traditions and from the Bible of that sort of dome shaped and, and multiple layers of heavens. And this is why Jesus ascended to heaven because they thought heaven, this is not a joke. There are people back in that day, they thought heaven was a place that you could point to and that they pointed up, up. That's totally right. That That's why ascensions were a thing, is because people believed that the gods were on high. They were up. Um, but it is worth pointing out that, like, educated people within the Roman Empire um, in the first century, um, at least well-educated people, didn't believe that the earth was flat. Um Right. And I'm unsure of whether or not Paul, for example, believed the earth was flat, but we definitely have like, we have good evidence that um, many educated uh, Romans and Greeks believed that the earth was spherical. Um, but they also, th their cosmology was still uh, s uh, based on different levels of heaven. And, you know, there were conceptions of like um, gateways between these heavens. And it, uh, it, there's a variety. It isn't exactly as if there's one view. And Jewish conceptions actually did differ from pagan ones. But yeah, anyway. So, yeah, Mike, you're painting a picture like this is just a ridiculous, crazy theory. But if you accept the fact that back in those days there was that cosmological view that there's these layers of heaven and this is not i forget mike if you i don't want to rewind but um did you say that you didn't that jesus didn't have a body like these 
this in this these places in heaven Jesus would have had a body it's just not an earthly body it's the heavenly body but it would still it's not like a intangible ethereal type it's like real um and so, still a body yeah. yeah it's it's still a body so and um Paul does actually talk about Jesus's body um I think it's in first Corinthians again I th- I think it's actually at the end of first Corinthians 15, maybe. Um, and he talks about like the substance of Jesus's body. And he talks about the different substances on earth and the substances in heavens and, you know, what Jesus's body is made out of and things like that. You know how people often say, you know, in the future, the antichrist is coming or some people believe the antichrist is already here, but really what carrier is talking about is that Jesus had to come because sin entered the world and Jesus was the anti Satan. To correct what, you know, the problems of of sin and so forth. Yeah, I think one thing I want to stress is that my personal views of doubting the resurrection claims have nothing to do with whether or not um, my, you know, I'm agnostic about whether or not Jesus existed. Like, I'm happy to grant that Jesus existed and died on the cross and things like that, um, and that he even had a ministry and had disciples and stuff, you know, in order to, you know, rebut these ridiculous claims that he rose from the dead. What happened in outer space? He teaches that the, but his theories are different for the apostles and different for different people. So um, the apostles were basically... Uh, the disciples were a, a large gathering of schizophrenic individuals. They were schizophrenics who happened to congregate together and have mass hallucinations or something like a mass hallucination. At least this is what I've heard from him. And, and uh, yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't think Richard Carrier says that. No, he doesn't. And he, he doesn't say that they were schizophrenic. He says that they were schizotypal, which is a different designation um, and doesn't describe like a pathology. It instead describes a significant tendency toward um, mystical experiences or hallucinations or visions. Um, and we have anthropological evidence that such people um, are fairly common within the population and not only that within certain segments of society both historical and even present today such figures can be elevated to high status within communities such that their visions are actually promoted and valued and um and repeated and encouraged hey mike you remember um paul talks about the thorn in his flesh maybe the thorn in his flesh was this um mental illness who knows it's plausible <laughs> then when it comes to like luke or the or the the actual gospels themselves richard carrier has this really complex web of theories about how luke must he he, he basically constructs the stories of jesus pulling from every ancient piece of literature you can think of um, he must have had a big library to pull from so myths and stories he's pulling from all these and he's creating like an amalgam in jesus so th- that way richard could say um jesus did this thing and that is kind of like something that happened in the story over here and so luke must have used this story to make up that it, but it's ad hoc this is the problem it's it's ad hoc i'll do more stuff on on richard carrier one day uh, in the future i, I think it would be a good idea about that too <laughs> okay so let's look at the next one dan barker dan barker was a former christian who um he is a former christian who uh, wrote music and stuff like that. But now he's he's part of what's called the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And Dan Barker goes around debating and teaching people on on basically why we shouldn't, you know, have religion or believe in Jesus or any of that stuff. He actually gives four reasons. Dan Barker, he gives four reasons why we should reject the resurrection of Christ. And I'm going to name them and then we'll talk about them for a minute. So first, the problem of history. Second, the the possible natural explanations. Third, the internal contradictions in the Bible. And then fourth, the legendary growth of the story. So briefly, it would take forever to do all these in detail, but briefly, Dan Barker's case against the resurrection. First, he says the problem of history. Now, this is where he does the same thing as Hume and Bart Ehrman. And he says, you have to assume miracles don't happen. That's how history works. And I quote him now. He says, if miracles do happen we still can't learn that from historical evidence okay that is that's just blinders that are being put on um you can't ask a question you're not allowed to 
So uh, I think that it's important to understand the nuance there. Um, the view is not that um, that they can't happen. It's that even on the assumption that they do, the type of evidence that we get within historical reporting is not sufficient to establish it. Now, I happen to actually think that that's true in the sense that thus far we haven't got evidence sufficient to establish a miracle from historical sources. But I don't think it's true, like, on a principled reason. You know, we could have evidence. It's just that thus far we don't have good enough evidence to like and i have personally i have a standard that you know i can that can be met that substantiates it um but yeah answer and then pretend like you've answered it okay so this problem of history that's his first one the second one the problem of natural ex possible natural explanations dan barker's a, a big advocate for alternate explanations but he won't pick one he just says, maybe one of those. But he knows if he picks one, then it pigeonholes him, and now he has a case that he has to defend, and none of them stand up to the evidence. Um, then he gets into what he calls are his two real reasons to reject the resurrection. And this is really interesting. Dan Barker, I mean, look, he is like a, an inspiring atheist to many people, right? An, an intellectual even to, to many. Um, He's a nice guy, too. He says... One, that there are internal contradictions, and two, that there's a legendary growth of the story. First off, we don't, in this case where we're saying that Jesus rose from the dead based upon the accepted facts of history, we don't need the Bible to not contradict. What I'm saying is, I, I don't think the Bible contradicts, but even if Dan was to prove the Bible contradicted, it wouldn't change these five facts. So this is what we call a red herring. This is just a distraction. And he considers that one of his best reasons not to believe the resurrection. So, do you want to talk about that? Well, I just okay. say, yeah. No, you go ahead. So, when we're looking at a text as a historical source, we make assessments of its reliability through examples of how well it meets certain things that we need to have in order to trust it. And certain examples that it can have that give us reason not to trust it. And so there are a variety of things that can exist within a text that lowers our confidence in its extraordinary claims. So, like, even if you have these minimal facts, and even if those were established, the idea that that means that you should actually hold as a probable explanation its extraordinary claims even in spite of the fact that the text is unreliable on a large number of other details, that idea is just false. It's, it's a invalid methodology. Yeah. I, I think, um, to sum that idea up is the way me, Cam and Dan Barker views that what Mike and other Christians might say, here's the evidence. We would say, no, that's not evidence for what you think it's for. It's evidence of a claim or evidence of writings that say certain things, but this is not evidence that what it says actually happened. It could be. It could be. The difficulty is that in the case of Mark, the first gospel written, which I repeat again, <laughs> <laughs> um, the source is actually of a very low quality historically. Um, it doesn't meet even the basic standards of historiography of authors of the time, let alone our standards today. Um, and we, you know, many scholars do argue for deliberate f fictionalization, such as what I argued in the case of its dependence on Psalm 22 in the Passion Narrative. I encourage Christians to, um, <clears throat> to take the apologetics that you might learn, um, and then for everything that you learn, uh, immediately go and look for one or two counter-reasoning reasons why what you just learned might not be true. That's why I like apologetics, actually. I'm changing my mind about it. Like, I, I think it opens up the avenues for people to actually, it's so easy to find information now. Um, anyhow. And then for the legendary growth of the story, and here's where 
he'll pick like the order in which he thinks the gospel was, were written, starting with Mark, you know, ending with John. And he'll show how there was like, the story got crazier and more miraculous as these different gospels were written, except that he's cherry picking. If you really take the gospels and line them up, you'll see sometimes Mark has a more miraculous moment. Sometimes John does, sometimes Luke does. It's an abuse of the, of the stuff. I think this is true. I think as you go from Mark to John, just the word count increases. I think that's true. I might be wrong about that. So you don't even have to go by uh, that it, the number, of, uh, and I think actually the number of miracles increase as you go from Mark to John. Well, at least in John, it, you have this claim at the end that, you know, uh, Jesus's miracles or signs were so numerous that it couldn't fill the pages in all the world or something. I, I, I'm not quoting that correctly, but it's something similar to that. So um, there's a, definitely a strong claim there in John. And keep in mind, if like most scholars believe that the long ending of Mark shouldn't be there, um, Mark, the first gospel ends in a cliffhanger. Um, there is no resurrection appearances. And then by the end of John, it's like, yeah, yay. It's like, um, there is, I think a Christian has to admit, there is a shift it, uh, from Mark to John, definitely. If you, you know, forget about uh, Matthew and Luke for, for, um, for a moment, there's like a pretty big difference between those two gospels. Yeah. I mean, even in Christology, I, I know that, um, that there are, good arguments that mark has a quite high hist christology too but it's definitely not as explicit as what john is and um john's view of jesus is highly theologized and does demonstrate a, you know a later a belief in the development of christianity and this matters because if that's if your best stuff is assumptions and red herrings and misrepresentation of the text so that's Dan Barker. And then we have Matt Dillahunty. Matt Dillahunty, a uh, host of the Atheist Experience, well-known atheist. Um, That's not a flattering picture of him. He's a tough one, Matt Dillahunty, because it's hard to nail him down. Matt Dillahunty won't take a position if he doesn't have to, because he's he's more about like attacking other people's positions. And he, he tries to not have a position a lot of the time. I've listened to his discussions, his debates. He tries to not actually have a position. Um, and so... That's part of his strategy. He, he'll do it over and over again. Watch his debates and you'll see it. You'll realize he's not even taking positions. He's just throwing rocks at the others. Um, Should you take a position if the evidence doesn't warrant it? He says he's not convinced of the facts themselves, though. So he, he leans, it seems, he leans towards the mythicist position. And in a long two-hour discussion with um, uh, Junta, a, a Christian apologist, I can't remember his first name right now, Matt Junta, Dale Junta, something. I forget his name. One of you might know it. He, it's blank. It, it's like an hour and a half in, and then finally the Christian gets Matt to admit that he basically disagrees with the vast majority of historians and thinks that he's not even convinced Jesus existed or that those facts are real. Then he was asked, okay, but if the if the facts are real, how would you explain those, Matt? And this guy's a really smart guy, right? He should be able to explain that. He says, I'll take any other explanation. Okay, that's a nice sweeping statement, but which what explanation works for you? And he won't answer. Matt won't answer. Uh, he refuses to pick an explanation to to explain those five facts because he knows they're indefensible. Then he moves into what I think is Matt's default position for when he really gets cornered in theist discussions. He says, I don't know, and me not knowing is an elite position that is wonderful, and now I'm going to mock Christians for saying that they do know. And that's kind of the direction he goes. He goes, I don't know. I don't know what it was. And I don't have to know. And that's the elite position. You're silly for trying to know. Then Matt was asked in the same debate, what evidence would convince you? And this is again, where I think, um, hard nosed blind faith skepticism is represented, um, as a position. He says, what evidence would convince you? And Matt says, I can't think of any evidence that would convince me, but surely if there's a God, then God knows what evidence would convince me. And since he hasn't given me that evidence, he either doesn't want me to know, or he doesn't care, or there just is no God. You see, even him refusing to believe is somehow evidence against God. Do, I mean, does that honestly, like if you're a skeptic and you're hearing me here, does that sound reasonable to you? Uh, I, I, um, Mike, to be honest, 
uh, I give, I disagree with uh, Matt Dillahunta here, and I do give specific things that would change Me my too. mind. And, Me too. And I think, I do think uh, Matt Dillahunta is a wuss for not uh, at least imagining coming up with something that plausibly could change his mind. Um, but here's the problem. When I have done, when I've told Christians what would change my mind, I still get lambasted. Like, that's not reasonable. Like, yeah. I can't win. It's like, I, I would be convinced, my, sorry, my confidence would go up to, the, I think, a high enough level that I would believe if, for example, my sister w could go from complete paralysis to jumping up and down. Um, well, Doug, that's, you're testing God. I've heard that. Or, or um, uh, even the, you, got, you got the scriptures, you don't need that. You know, stuff like that I hear time and time again. Well, and and my um, my uh, believing that sufficient evidence for me would be these independent appearances across all of the world geographically to people who were um, capable of recording them accurately. That it's it's not even hard for Jesus. Jesus could walk through walls. Jesus flew up into the sky. It's not an unreasonable expectation, but not only that, it's directly in line with the sole purpose of Jesus on earth, which is to redeem humanity and enable them to have a path towards salvation um, despite their sin. And why wouldn't Jesus appeal, uh, appear to all of the earth? It, to me, taking seriously the claims of Christians, it feels totally reasonable for me to think that that is something that Jesus would do. And he would save more people. I would be a Christian today. You in the audience would probably be a Christian today, at least if you have an epistemology similar to mine. And many of the world's people from the time that Jesus appeared on earth till now would have been disp saved as opposed to potentially dying in hell and burning for the rest of their life. You know, that's if hell is true. But, or, you know, going to, you know, an eternal sleep or something well if so I, I just i don't think that my request is unreasonable it it's an honest opinion of my epistemic standards and maybe we're just maybe this is all true what mike is saying and we're vessels created for destruction like i mean i know it it flies as far as sarcasm and mocking and criticism goes but is it reasonable to say here's the evidence and you say, let's follow Matt's logic. Here's these evidence. Historians agree. I deny the historians. But what if they're right? Okay, even if they're right, I think any other explanation is good. But which explanation? I have no idea. But you know what? The fact that I don't know is noble. And I'm more elite than you because I don't know. Okay, well, I have the evidence. I have one working explanation. You, have, you offer no alternative. And I think the evidence is explained by this. And so your conclusion is that what? What, what more do you want? I don't know. But the fact that God hasn't given, given it to me proves that I'm right. <laughs> Well, Mike, I, I think, I, I don't know for certain, but I think uh, Matt Dillahunty would say something very similar to what uh, Cam and I said in the early part of this video when we went through those five things. Why we can uh, not ha be confident in each of those five facts. Now, those, and even if those five things um, are the scholarly consensus, uh, that still doesn't mean that, you know, I think you agree, that doesn't mean that Jesus definitely rose from the dead. Um, in fact, as we get to the end, I want to give my theory of what actually happened. I, you know, it's just a guess. Me too. But anyhow, let's keep going. Me too. Also, I, I want to point out that, like, Mike is relying on what he deems to be scholarly consensus. Well, I don't actually think that it really is. But there are many, many places on the New Testament and the Old Testament where Mike goes entirely against the consensus. And I think that that's relevant because apparently um, the 
the, the consensus doesn't really matter. Like, at least Mike is a layman, as am I. You're a layman, Doug. And there's an instance of us apparently going against the consensus and an instance of him going against the consensus. Yet he thinks it's such a crime that we do it. And we're well motivated to do it by good reasoning, too. But anyway. Mike, if you're going to give Matt... Dillahunty a, prob a hard time for going against the scholarly consensus, then I encourage you to email or me private message Jonathan McClatchy. Just 24 hours ago, he admitted proudly that he goes against the cons scholarly consensus. So if you... So, uh, yeah, and here's a really, really harsh criticism of Mike. Mike's f near foundational reason for believing in the truth of Christianity and this is something that he has stated. Now, I won't say it's his foundational reason, but he tells me that this is very important, is his belief that Daniel was a prophetic author writing hundreds of years in like the 6th century or 7th century BCE, predicting elements of Jesus' narrative in the 1st century. And he considers that to be the greatest instance of prophecy or one of the greatest instances and a strong reason why he believes. Yet the scholarly consensus thinks that the author of Daniel was actually writing in the second century BCE, around 400 years after the author purports to be writing, and is in fact only simply summarizing things that occurred prior by writing them into a historical narrative. Yeah, that's this, consensus. Yeah. Mike doesn't believe it. What? <laughs> yeah, uh, let me make this boom moment even more booming. You're just giving Matt Dillahunty, you just gave Matt Dillahunty a hard time for going against the scholarly consensus. Uh, Mike Winger, I'm going to give you a hard time right now. Why are you going against the scholarly consensus on Daniel? Why? What's wrong with you? Are you just doing this because you really want to believe? just like Matt Dillahunty really doesn't? Do you have this presupposition for miracles, just like Matt Dillahunty, you might think it doesn't? Why are you going against the scholarly consensus, Mike Winger, on that Moses probably didn't exist, and Abraham probably didn't exist, and that the last part of Daniel is written way after the fact, prophecies that you have told me personally that have convinced you that the Bible is reliable, why are you going against the consensus? Shame on you, Mike. Just like shame on Matt Dillahunty, right? How's that for... And, and honestly, I, I don't think that this is a fair criticism because I do actually think that people should go against the scholarly consensus when they find uh, reasons why they think it's wrong. Like, I think it's okay for a layman like Mike to do that and not to blindly follow the consensus. He should evaluate the evidence for himself. But the problem is, is that that's not how this apologetic works. Mike's apologetic relies on appealing to consensus to substantiate his claims. If he wants to do that, he should be consistent. Beliefs come first, reasons come second. A great author once said that, and my cousin. Like, this is, this is nutty. <laughs> yeah, it so, is. Um, this is. This is these guys. I, oh, I, there's one more, Sam Harris. Ah, uh, yes. Sam Harris says that no evidence is good enough. Um, this last atheist, Sam Harris, very smart guy, really, really intelligent guy, well-spoken. He talks very slowly. Let me, let me read a quote from you, from him to you. Sam Harris said, even if we had multiple contemporaneous eyewitness accounts of the miracles of Jesus, this still wouldn't prove sufficient basis to believe that these events, events actually occurred. Even if we have, even if we had more, more evidence, even if, whatever the evidence, it doesn't matter. Evidence doesn't matter. He's not saying You shouldn't that. believe it. That's the... Th hey, uh, oh. there's um, multiple testimonial evidence of the golden plates in Mormonism. What do you do with that? There's multiple testimonial evidence of the miracles of, uh, what's his name, uh, Saisa Baba. Saisa, yeah. yeah. Sai Sai Baba, Baba. 
There's multiple independent attestation by historians uh, for uh, miracles of healing by Vespasian. It's, um, yeah, let's move on. The I'm thing get, I see getting riled up, every Cam. single atheist and skeptic now is we don't care about the evidence. We do care. We don't believe it. You shouldn't believe it. You're a fool for believing you it. You can believe it. And we're justified for not. And that's our position. So there's um there's a rundown of skeptics, modern day skeptics who come against the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And I do encourage you to check out their their videos and the things that they say and ask yourself this, when are they just making an assumption that it didn't happen? When are they offering real evidence? When are they changing the subject to a red herring? Like, um, let's talk about Bible contradictions. Um, when you're like, okay, but the whole point of my case was that I was taking accepted historical facts, not coming to you telling you uh, that you have to use uh, the Bible as inspired. So uh, I, I haven't explicitly said this yet, but let's just criticize for a moment the minimal facts form of apologetics and the form of argumentation. In valid argumentation, we are required to assess and account for all pieces of evidence relevant to the claim. So an apologetic that's deliberately designed to exclude certain things, and as Mike seems to imply, consider them off the table for analysis, is explicitly an invalid method. If there is something about the Gospels that pertains to its reliability and decreases its reliability, that fact is relevant when it comes to the miracle claims that the Gospel makes. Anyway... Yeah, um, I, uh, Mike, you, you know, uh, you and I have talked privately many times, and I have brought up issues to you that historians propose that you have not even heard of. You've admitted to me that to me at least once, and and it's like if you if you're coming from a perspective that you're just. Uh, So I'm going to take a few other things and then I'm going to get to your guys' questions because I want to hear from you what you have to say, maybe a challenge that you have to present to me. Oh, we're actually It done. should mean something to you, though, that lead atheists, model atheists, atheists that represent model, yeah, other atheists, atheists in their thinking, the atheists that atheists learn from, that they have such seemingly Just foolish, say already, Mike. unreasonable, blind faith responses to the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And there is more evidence. This is only five facts. There's other facts we could add in there too. Um, there's other lines of reasoning we can use as well. This is just one case through a series of evidence. So here's other answers. It might already be in your mind. You might be like, Mike, but you're using the Bible. You can't use, look at this. You can't, you can't use the Bible. You can't use the Bible. That's one book. That's one source. Okay, that, that betrays an ignorance about the scriptures. Um, the Bible is actually multiple. There's 66 different documents in the scriptures written over, over hundreds years. and hundreds of years of time. By 40 authors. Um, the Bible itself, even just the New Testament, is multiple documents through multiple authors. It has a consistent and message. we are treating them as simply historical documents. In fact, they're, the first century documents we have about Christ are primarily now carried in the Bible. Um, so you can, you, you do take these and skeptics who are historians, they use the Bible. This is a normal thing for them to do. Uh, not, not yeah, I, I do that to enter their worldview mostly, but, um, yeah, not well known, but you can't simply be like, that's the Bible. So throw it out. Cause all that is, is a blind faith position against the Bible. There are many reasons to think, Mike, I agree with that, the, the, I, but I want to say there's many reasons to think Mike, that, that when you open up the book of Mark, that you're not reading history. And I challenge you to, uh, for you on your own, to come up with, let's say, five or six reasons why when you read uh, part of that chapter, a part of that chapter, a part of that chapter, that this might not be history. And until you can be honest with yourself and say, yeah, I actually understand how some people can view this as not history. I see their point. When you get to that point, I think, well, that's going to be very dangerous for you because your foundation is going to start to crumble. Because I think you have to we're talking about the core essence of christianity here that once you start doubting that what you're reading actually happened in the past it's like a domino effect 
and at least it was for me. Yeah, I, I think that the Gospel of Mark is largely um, historical fiction, and it may be uh, based on in some um, some elements of its story historical facts, but. I think that we have sufficient evidence to demonstrate that many of the stories appearing in Mark's gospel, which is subsequently repeated in other gospels, are actually fictionally composed in the same manner in which we find fictional composition of the period in, in the period in question. Um, and I think that I, a very compelling case can be made for that. You, you should take the Bible, if nothing else, at least as a historical document in no, this discussion. Not always. Um, some people, like Richard Carrier, Sometimes. he likes to say that people who, who um, believe that Jesus really existed or believe in the resurrection, they're Christians. And this is like, that's all it takes in some people's minds to discount everything that they say. Oh, yeah, of course, of course, William Lane Craig, after doing all his historical research, he believes Jesus rose from the dead, but he's a Christian. No, okay, this, I, I have to be honest with you here, Mike, this bothers me, because if you look at the testimonies, and I get so much grief when I talk to Christians and I ask about their testimony, Christians are scared to give Pine Creek their testimonies now, because if you look at William Lane Craig's testimony, he believed long, long before he even knew, like, a tenth of what he knows now, like, a minuscule of the evidence. He had an existential angst. He said, there has to be something after this. Life can't be meaningless. And then he met a girl in, a, in his uh, classroom who exuded joy, and he, that was attractive to him. Like These are the stories of why people believe. Mike, you yourself believe. Because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, but I am really, really deep within the literature of New Testament scholars. And I'm aware of all, like, well, not all, but many, many of the primary figures in the field who publish on the subject. And honestly, I am struggling as hard as I can to think of an example of one New Testament historian who was a Christian who came to their belief after becoming a scholar. Yeah. Or while they were studying to become like, you know, to get a PhD in the subject. But, and this is honestly true, I can think of off the top of my head three or four, maybe even, four, no, five, Hector Avalos, Dennis McDonald, Robert Price. I can, I can think of a, a number of Bart people Ehrman. who, Bart Ehrman, who converted after getting their PhD or deconverted or at least became agnostic toward the stories within the text. And it, can you say the same thing? I, I don't think you can. And it's, it's interesting. It. I've said this many times, I'm going to very quickly say it again, between the ages of 18 and 22 is when, when you've been indoctrinated, you're raised in a Christian home, you start to doubt and struggle, you have these experiences and so forth, it's a rough time in your life, then you do the research and you come to realize, oh, the core beliefs of my parents happen to be true. This happens in almost every religion. At the, in a ha well, if, isn't it strange to people out there that these, a lot, I'm not saying all, all people, I'm not saying all experiences, but isn't it strange that these things and this happens at this time in, in life, late teens, early twenties? And um, Jeff Durbin, addict, almost died. Wife's a Christian, becomes a Christian. Lee Strobel, drunkard, hedonist, life's a mess. Wife's becomes a Christian, he becomes a Christian. Yes, he did two years of study. I understand that, but this happened before. Um, uh, Dan Brown. No, the, who's the Jewish guy? Um, uh, I forget his name. But anyhow, same thing. Addiction. Crazy guy. A uh, few gals take him to church, becomes a Christian, then becomes a scholar. Uh, and, you know, guys like James White, they, are, you know, they, didn't, they don't have these crazy experiences, but they've been indoctrinated from very young. 
Which is not to say, like, I'm not trying to dismiss their case because of their personal stories. It's just that, like, if you want to maintain and you want to make the counterclaim or the initial claim that, like, the motivation of these yeah. people who who um, reject the claims is because they haven't honestly evaluated the evidence, then you need to at least consider sociologically what is going on within the field. What is going on within the field sociologically is that more people who start out as fundamentalist Christians fall away from that belief upon their critical study of the, of the New Testament. And I think that that's empirically demonstrable. And, and I think one of the reasons why, well, I won't say that. Um, my last interview with you, Mike, was a pretty powerful one. And I think... A lot of Christians, not all, but a lot of Christians are Christians because they love Jesus. This is an emotional thing. They're so thankful that their guilt and sins have been lifted. They know that they can pray to him. He's always there for them. These are deep emotional things that I, I don't blame you um, for wanting it, wanting it. It's very appealing. But please realize that it's like a mother whose son has committed a murder and all the evidence, not all the evidence, but the evidence seems to mount up that maybe he's guilty of murder, but the mother just can't see it. The mother's, no, my boy could never do that. I love my boy. He would never do such a thing. Consider the possibility, Mike, that your love for Jesus prevents you from maybe seeing the evidence as we see it. That's why I, I've come up with a new thing. Like, maybe take the position for like two hours that you couldn't care less about Jesus and then look at the evidence with fresh eyes. Or alternatively, one, I think, good way to do things. Like, I think as historians, historians should be able to adopt paradigms of study and then attempt to um, assess the evidence within that paradigm. I would challenge Mike... I would challenge him to adopt what is currently the consensus positions within New Testament studies. For example, Mark and priority, the dependence of Mark on Mark by Matthew and Luke, the discrepancies between these accounts. Adopt that position and then read the Gospels and see whether or not he finds that um, that position uh, makes sense of them. And I don't think that he's done that. And I submit as evidence for this the fact that I asked Mike Winger the question, what do you think of the synoptic problem and what do you think is the most plausible solution to it? And Mike couldn't answer me and he didn't even know what the synoptic problem was. That's concerning. You're, a, you're teaching young people about the Bible and you don't know rudimentary things within the field. And I don't know. I, I, I hate to call you out, but that's what I think. Uh, okay. We have two choices here. Uh, there, I, I know from memory that there was a few things in the Q and a that um, I wanted to talk about, but we've been going long enough. So I want to give, let's, Let's uh, Mike messaged me privately before we did this live stream and asked me to give you know my sort of my my theory on on this guy named Jesus. So I want to re see if I can rewind this. Bear with me. It's so fake. Except that the pro problem here is that. Um, I'll bring it back in. Don't worry, Cam. Let's. I just want to bring up that list. Where is it? There we go. It's okay. Mike's prettier than me anyway. Okay. So here's the five facts. You're, I think you wanted me to... I think I can bring you in now, Cam. Now, this is all speculation, right? So, but here's, here's a little story I want to tell you, Mike. Once upon a time, there was an apocalyptic preacher who came out of the Essene movement around 2,000 years ago. Very charismatic. Um, preached basically the end times, that you know the end of the world's coming soon. The, um, the culture at the time was very superstitious. I mean, very, very, very superstitious. And um, 
people were looking for a Messiah because just like you, like they, they read Daniel. And so they were looking around, expecting some type of Messiah to come. Um, so this Jesus guy is walking around, preaching, uh, getting a following. And, um, and, and he died. He caused trouble. Um, he died by crucifixion. I'm not... I'm not sure why they crucified him. Was it just sedition or something? Um, was it blasphemy? Maybe. Who knows? But he, uh, but I'm just looking at your facts here, right? Death by crucifixion. So I'm granting that. Okay, so he died by crucifixion. Ladies uh, find them to tomb. Um, as I said earlier, I'm not confident that that actually happened. Why? Because... The sources for the ladies find an empty tomb was lit, written a lifetime after, probably a thousand miles away, probably in either Greece or Italy. This happened in, in um, Palestine area. So now we have a problem. How how can we be confident that this actually happened? Especially when we have um, variations in the story. Um, anybody who could have verified it was most likely dead, or a thousand miles away, or both. Um, independent appearances of Jesus' life. Okay, so let's say people who followed this Jesus guy around from the Essene movement um, loved him deeply. And when he died, it shook them up. It just devastated them. And as people do today who have lost loved ones, they had an experience of Jesus. Now, if you... I believe that we can doubt the 500 witnesses story. I believe we can doubt even the 40 witness, uh, 40 days appearing to people story. So all those independent appearances, it might have only this, these independent appearances could have been visions like we see so many times today among only two or three people. And then it kind of spread like wildfire, like I saw Jesus. Now, this happens today, even with us. Uh, I never can pronounce his name, but Saya said Baba. This same thing happened with him. People still see him around, even though he's been dead for like 10 years or something. The violence endured to the, uh, by the apostles. Again, how do we know that, for example, they were martyred for their belief in the resurrection? It only says that up at, maybe at best for two people in the Bible. And we don't know exactly why they died. We don't know that maybe they did recant uh, about a bodily a re resurrection and they were killed anyhow. They could have been just killed for sedition. All the other um, stories of martyrdom are in the Apocrypha or later traditions, sometimes a hundred years later or more. How, how, why, why should I be confident that? And, and we know that people die for things that they know to be true but are actually mistaken and they're not true. Uh, enemies of Christ converted. I believe there's only one, and that is Paul. And I think Paul, is, psychologically, it can be shown that people who uh, commit a lot of heinous acts against a group might feel guilty about it. He also had this vision. He, The guilt and the vision convinced him um, that he had seen Jesus as well. How's that? Is that did I miss anything? So there's an explanation Mike, that fits all those five things that does not require a low probability event. Everything I said has happened in history before. So why couldn't it have happened then? How did I do, Cam? Is yours the same or you want to do a little different? I think mine's very different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But um, but that's it's close. Good. I mean, I think that I think that that's a plausible historical story, especially by the basis of the Essene and like the way in which people psychologically could act after the death of like a prominent figure, and the fact that it's attested within you know many societies and examples. Um, do do you want mine? Yeah. Um, I have a feeling mine's so, going to like mine better though. <laughs> probably, probably. But let's just go one through five to begin with about how plausible I think each is. Uh, death by crucifixion, I think it's about 50-50. Ladies finding the tomb, 
empty, I think that that's about like, you know, 5% or 3% or it's very low. Independent appearances, I think that state, statement number three implies something that's untrue. I think that when you read Paul first and then the gospel second, you get a very different perspective on what these appearances were, what their character was, and you find that it fits a lot more within the sociological understanding of the way that humans act. Number four, violence endured by the apostles, almost entirely baseless, at least as far as the later second century stories about the apostles of Jesus go. And then number five, only true of Paul, although I don't know that he was necessarily an enemy of Christ. I think that he was more of like a persecutor of Christians. I don't really think that he understood much about what the beliefs of Christ were by Christians when he was persecuting them. My story, I think that we should first start with our earliest um, sources, and those are the sources of Paul. What we find attested in here, I think, um, indicates that there was some kind of cult that was uh, worshipping some figure as a saviour. That figure may or may not have been a historical figure who had died in the recent past, but at least they came to believe um, of him through visions, uh, visions that are very much like in common with cargo cults and millenarian cults in general, um, visions of this figure playing a salvific role, and they came to deify him and consider him an exalted figure. From there, later on, about 40 years later, hagiographies in a no novelistic style were written by anonymous authors and circulated amongst Christian communities, which convinced the bulk of Christianity to eventually adopt a largely historical view based on primarily the work of Mark originally, which can be demonstrated to be a mimetic um, uh, narrative influenced by Old Testament and the Homer Homeric epics. And then from there, we find subsequent gospel, gospel authors redacting the original mark, elevating and increasing the story until eventually we have a almost entirely um, mythical a narrative about a historical figure who may have existed and may have actually taught certain things, but we are unsure. Can you hear the organ music? This is the time for the altar call. Um, now, I want to point out, Mike, uh, just to sum up that uh, both Cam and I veered from the scholarly consensus. We admit it on the, those five points somewhat, just like you do. We veered off from the scholarly consensus just like you do when it comes to... Well, I don't think that the scholarly consensus is what um, Mike says well, on some because of the, on I don't some of the, the numbers it have a views are trustworthy, but yes, but carry on. But on number one, I think uh, I think he's right. But anyhow... Um, yes, so, too. me too. Um, so that's... Uh, 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 two explanations that are uh, that happen more frequently in history than a resurrection. Now, I'm going to do a little guilt trip here. If you value truth, you have to consider the possibility that just like there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world who you think are wrong, that there might be 2.2 .2 billion Christians in the world who might be wrong. And that what you think you're feeling every day when you wake up and pray the love of Jesus in your heart actually might not be what you think it is. Ugh, I shouldn't go there. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I actually feel bad. About I would that. encourage people to pick up a book other than The Case for Christ, pick up a book other than Evidence Demand Demands a Verdict, pick up a book other than The Case for the Resurrection by Habermas and, and Lycona, pick up a book other than William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith read the literature of experts in the field, you will be surprised. They do not agree with Mike. Even the Christians of the field admit that there are contradictions, discrepancies, and instances of unreliability in the Gospels. It's get in touch with the literature. Pick up a book. It's worth it.
So I think we're done. I hope Mike still talks to us after this. I have a feeling he won't. I'm sure he will make a scathing critique. <laughs> he will go back and forth for a few weeks. Uh, I um, I want to try. I always like to try to build a bridge at the end. Well, I like Mike. Uh, that's all I can say to build a bridge. Is as much as I think that he's, um, you know, m not well informed on the subject. I like him as a person. And I think that it's awesome that he's producing new content for Christians. And um, I think he's got some novel things going on. I love the production value of his channel. Yeah, I, I sometimes that. sometimes yeah. find um, nuggets of wisdom in his uh, wisdom in the word or whatever he does series. And yeah, so. Oh, I know how I can build a bridge. I want to give Mike an out. Just like for five years from now. <laughs> um, consider the possibility that there is a God um, that can give you the basis of morality that you want and um, that has the earth in his hands or whatever that started the universe, created the universe. Keep all that uh, if you want. Um, but consider the possibility that maybe Christianity is wrong and and um, that you'll be okay, that you will not be harmed by leaving Christianity. Consider the possibility that you will not be harmed if you leave Christianity. I truly believe that that is what is part of the reason why a lot of Christians feel they need to stay in it, is that they feel they need uh, some basis for morality, they need an explanation for first cause, and that they're scared of hell. I know I'm not describing all Christians here, but I think I'm describing a lot. If you can just... so you, The out I'm giving you is deism, basically. Um, it, it comes with a lot less baggage. <laughs> um, but I think like what Cam says, that if you start reading material that as a kid, Christians are told not to read because they're liberal historians who have this predisposition and presuppositions against miracles and all that stuff. I think you'll find that these are just normal human beings doing their job the best of their ability and coming up with conclusions way different than you. Anyhow, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we've had a Thanks all. consistently 50 people here watching at a time. Uh, I caught a few questions. Oh, uh, Cam, before you go, there was one request uh, that I'll tell Cam if he can't hear me, but one request that some of this um, things that Cam read, I'll encourage him to put in the comment section tomorrow so you can verify and look these things up for yourself. And um, it's all about learning. Have a good night. Take care, Mike.